Uh, testing, testing. Uh, did somebody just post to see if my audio is coming through? This is my first time doing a little live broadcast with this setup. OK, uh, it sounds to me like that's working. Wonderful. Um, so I would uh, like to welcome everyone who's tuned in from Germany at the Spezzy Bike Show, or the virtual Spezzy Bike Show, or wherever you happen to be. Um, I was really looking forward to attending this event. Um, hello, <laughs> you from Montreal, from the UK, from Kelowna, from Oregon. Uh, this is pretty cool. Um, so uh, the Spezzy Bike Show is uh, I think the translation is literally a special bike show, and it's where all the kind of unusual bikes get featured and showcased. Um, and it's something that I've so longed for attending and being a part of. I've heard about it from a lot of our customers and dealers in Europe, and this was finally going to be the year where we were ourselves going to have a booth. Um, we had some projects up our sleeves we wanted to showcase, and, uh, and I was keen to give presentations that I thought would be of topical interest to the audience there. Um, and uh, now I'm giving those same presentations uh, to the world at large. So um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Justin Lamar Elmer, and I've had an interest in electric bicycles for quite a long time. Um, this here, let me just get the, um, oh, where did that go? Website. Um, Pointer, there we go. Uh, this was the very first electric bike that I myself built back in 2003. Uh, I was an engineering physics student at the University of British Columbia at the time and uh, realized that electric bikes uh, overlapped two of my uh, primary interests, which were electric motors, uh, electric circuits, and then cycling. Um, and uh, I sort of uh, caught wind of the Yahoo Power Assist groups um, and various online forums in those days and got a very early version of the Crystallite hub motor. Um, that was enormously exciting for me to um, uh, produce something that combined these sort of academic interests with something very practical. Um, the first bike was, you know, these are uh, nickel metal hybrid batteries salvaged from uh, surplus laptop packs that were taped together to a frame, but the amount of grin and enthusiasm the first time any of us hit our throttle and uh, felt motor power under our seat was uh, was phenomenal. Um, and it wasn't just me who felt that, it was a lot of my uh, classmates as well. Uh, so we formed an electric bike club at UBC for our last couple of years when we were there, uh, where we were building projects for ourselves and trying to incorporate um, electric bicycles and electric bike technology in some of our senior design courses. and. Um, and that was my interest. Uh, that's where it was started from. And it's become my sort of life's passion and mission ever since. Um, and these very first electric bike uh, projects that I built were using hub motors. And prior to me um, actually sourcing and finding this hub motor, I kept daydreaming and scheming about all these other ways of using existing motors that I could salvage from dumpsters at the university that we could find from other applications, you know, the high RPM RC motors. Um, and imagining various gearing and gear reduction systems to get it to spin the wheel of the bike or spin the cranks. And once we saw that we could buy a motor already built into the hub wheel, um, it just seemed so elegant. And I was sold on this idea of a hub motor as being so much more practical than having a mechanical linkage, bringing the motor um, to the to couple to the drive pin of the bike. Um, and that interest and love of hub motors has been with me ever since. And uh, what I want to do here is share uh, some of the things I've learned about hub motors, some of my, of my experience working with them, not just as a hobbyist, but as a professional and as a, as a designer since then. Um, so uh, why hub motors? And in this day and age, uh, if you talk to most people in the electric bicycle scene, um, almost everyone will be touting mid drives as being uh, the way to go for e-bikes. There's a little strong perception that hub motors are an old technology. They're not that efficient. Um, that's you know sort of a dying breed for how to propel a bike and that the whole future is with mid drives. And I am firmly not uh, in, in that camp. Um, and uh, Part of my goal here is to, to expand the, the um, capabilities of hub motors so that they are compatible with all the modern bicycles that are out there. Um, but one of the really nice things about hub motors is that they're incredibly versatile for building electric vehicles. Um, so a hub motor, 
it allows you to run the system to power the vehicle completely independently of the human drivetrain. So if you're experimenting with, you know, belt drive systems or, or crankshafts, if you want to have just a pure electric where you're pedaling a generator and then the motor propels you, um, the hub motor allows you to move that vehicle uh, regardless of what the mechanical coupling of the human rider is. Um, so on the left here, I've got a, a row bike where you're doing a reciprocating motion with the arms and the legs. Um, and the, there's no easy way to, to put power in in that reciprocating motion, whereas putting it in the hub motor allows us to seamlessly get uh, mechanical propulsion added to the drive. Um, and hub motors also let you add multiple motors to a system too. So on the right here is a cargo bike. This is something that uh, um, one of my ex-partners built when we were just starting our, our business and we had to ferry um, packages to the post office to ship off when we were selling motor kits. Uh, so we built a tricycle that was just the width to fit through the door to the, the business place that we were leasing. And this is powered by two hub motors. And so when you're carrying loads upwards of you know four or 500 pounds, um, the ability to share that load among multiple motors uh, is a very versatile function that hub motors let you do while still maintaining sort of bicycle components throughout. Um, and then here in the middle is a, a photo that one of our customers recently sent us. And this is an elliptical bike. And I believe the company making this was one of the sponsors of the Spezzy Bike Show is going to be exhibiting. And here again, you're uh, riding like you're on an elliptical with your arms and your legs moving in a, a back and forth motion rather than a circular motion. Um, and he was able to electrify this by putting one of our all axle hub motors on one of the two front wheels there uh, without having to touch the rather innovative uh, mechanical link. Um, and the hub motor has a nice benefit that the propulsion what's driving the vehicle is totally independent from the human propulsion. So if one fails, the other's always functional. And that's a sometimes overlooked detail for people um, when it comes to the, the reliability and robustness of a vehicle. And I've had a new, numerous instances in my own life where my mechanical drive train has failed, where I've either broken the chain or where my derailleur's gotten clogged or jammed into the spokes or something. And I've been able to safely continue my commute or my trip just relying on the hub motor alone. Um, and similarly, if the hub motor fails, you can usually just keep pedaling the bicycle without any issue. Um, and, uh, and there's generally motors available for front, for front applications, rear applications, and uh, single side applications as well. All right, so I'm gonna now go over this sort of construction style of motors that are available. Um, and at the present, I would broadly categorize the motors that are on the market right now into three types of groups. Um, in the past, we would normally talk about direct drive motors and geared motors. Um, so direct drive motors are the largest and heaviest motors. They were the first hub motors to be widely popularized. Um, and they were made possible by the advances in rare earth magnets, um, allowing us to have quite substantial torque densities that weren't available with motors from say the 70s and 80s. Um, a geared motor has uh, a high speed spinning motor inside the hub shell um, and geared motors in the past were uh, usually about a five to one gear ratio on average. Um, we've recently seen even tinier geared motors coming to market uh, where the motor inside is an in-runner rather than an out-runner. And I'll explain in the, in the next slides the differences between those. Um, and these are motors with an even higher gear reduction ratio, often in the 10 to 14 uh, RPM difference between the motor and the shell. And because of that, they're able to get even lighter still, down in the 1.2 to 3 kilogram range. Um, so we'll start off talking about direct drive motors. Uh, the direct drive motors, I have a very... Uh, soft spot in my heart for. Uh, my first motors were direct drive motors. And there's something about the complete simplicity and elegance of the direct drive motor um, that uh, has an enormous appeal. So in a direct drive motor, the motor is the hub. There's no difference between the motor and the hub. In a conventional electric motor, you you, you know, you have a, a motor shell that's stationary and the shaft is spinning. In a hub motor, you take that, you hold the shaft, and then the hub shell spins. Um, and that becomes a bicycle wheel. Um, so the motor is the hub, um, and in a typical construction, uh, you have a series of magnets um, on the perimeter of the motor, um, and those magnets are forced to turn through the uh, flow of current through the stator of the motor, and the motor stator is rigidly mounted to the axle. Um, so the hub motor like this, because it has no moving parts in it other than the ball bearings, uh, it makes them easy to service. There's very few uh, specialty components inside it, and there's very few things that can go wrong and fail. 
Uh, the downside of this is that in order to achieve the kind of torque levels needed to propel a human on a bicycle, the size of these motors has to be rather large. And so when you have a given force on a magnet, the further that magnet is from the axle, the more torque you get from that same amount of force. Uh, uh, same amount of force. And if we go back a bit to the, you know, my very first motors that we built here, these motors had a diameter of maybe about six inches. Um, as the industry evolved, the diameter of these direct drive motors kept getting larger and larger. Um, so here we're talking more like an eight inch diameter and pushing that to the extreme, Bionics even went with their Bionics D series, um, had a motor that was, I don't know, it was 14 or 15 inches in diameter. Um, and that enables you to get more and more torque density and a higher torque to weight ratio. Um, and, uh, and at some point you would hit kind of diminishing returns, but the downside of a direct drive motor is it has to be big in diameter if you want it to be efficient at making large torques, and a big diameter motor would end up being fairly heavy, and most of the direct drive motors are in the five to six kilogram range. Um, the other style of motor that's incredibly common and really came prominent, I'd say in the mid 2000s uh, to about 2015 or so, uh, were small geared motors that had a single planetary stage gear reduction. Um, so these motors, the construction of the motor is very much like the direct drive hub motor, where there's a ring um, that has the magnets on it and a stator that's inside the ring that's connected to the motor axle. And this is very much similar in appearance to the direct drive motor here. Um, only it's about one third to one quarter the size. If you look at the motor inside a geared hub motor and weight it, this motor weight might weigh one kilo or 1.2 kilos. Um, but the smaller size means less torque and less torque would be useless when you're trying to drive a vehicle. Um, so the motor is geared through a uh, planetary gear uh, reduction uh, in order to amplify that torque to the motor shell. And these single stage planetary gears would typically have between a four to five to one uh, transmission ratio. And that would mean, you know, five Newton meters from a motor would produce 20 to 25 Newton meters on the hub shell. Um, there's a lot more moving parts inside a geared motor, obviously. You have the three gears, each of the planet gears has a ball bearing. Um, the planet gears themselves are typically mounted on a freewheeling clutch so that the uh, hub spins freely when you're not using the motor and doesn't force the motor itself to turn. Um, you can, I said that the, the weight of these motors is about um, one third the, the kind of weight of the direct drive motor, but then it's geared five to one. So you end up actually getting a higher torque output from some of these small geared motors than you do from a larger direct drive motor. Um, and they would uh, usually be in the two and a half to three and a half kilogram range. Um, some, some of the large ones will get up to four kilos, and there's some small ones that are about uh, 2.0. Um, and these motors are, are incredibly popular, um, fairly robust, and made by lots and lots of manufacturers. Um, the kind of newer motor to come onto the scene are in-runner motors. And the difference between an in-runner motor and an out-runner motor is the location, the relative location of the part of the motor that's spinning versus the part of the motor that's stationary. And we're used to most of the electric motors we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives are in-runners. And in an in-runner, it's the axle itself that spins. So the motor inside one of these geared in-runners um, has a spinning axle rather than a spinning hub shell. What that allows is a much smaller sun gear inside the middle of the motor assembly. On the outrunner motors, the, the motor itself has to spin over top of the axle that traveler traverses through the entire hub. And that puts a sort of a, a lower limit on how small the sun gear can be, and that in turn puts a limit on how much of a gear reduction they can achieve. Um, so these in-runners often have very tiny sun gears, and they also have a double stage planetary gear. So you can see that the first uh, sun gear in the middle uh, goes against a, a larger helical uh, planet gear, and then there's a smaller planet gear, which is then rubbing, or is then engaged with the ring gear, the hub shell. And that double stage combined with the smaller inside sun gear um, allows these hubs to have in the 10 to 14 to one reduction ratio. Um, and that allows the same kind of torque output as we saw in the previous ones, but even less weight still. Uh, we've seen these motors as small as 1.2 kilograms. Um, the ones we sell most often now are 2.3. Um, there's some large ones on the market that are three to 3.5, but they get about maybe a 20% weight advantage over the same 
power or the same torque capability of a single stage outrunner motor. Um, so those are the three main classes of motors. When you're uh, considering a hub motor in an electric vehicle project, the uh, significant consideration, of course, is how is it going to mount on the bicycle? And up until maybe, you know, 10 years ago, almost all bicycles were really nicely standardized. Um, if you took the wheel off a bicycle, there was a slot where the axle fit inside it. And if you measure the distance between the slots on the left and the right dropouts, the slot is called a dropout, that was 100 millimeters on your front fork, and it was 135 millimeters on the rear. And so the hub motors would be designed with an axle that fits inside that slot, and then your front motor would be 100 millimeters, the rear would be 135. Um, as the bike industry has moved forward to new, more robust, stronger standards, um, those old standards are a little bit of a bygone on modern bikes these days. Um, and nowadays, a lot of bikes are using through axles. And a through axle, you can't actually slide the hub up inside the fork. Um, you have an axle that comes in from the outside, and that secures the axle more uh, positively so that it can't, the wheel can't fall out on you, and it makes for stiffer suspension forks. But it means it's completely incompatible with virtually all the motors <laughs> that are on the market right now. Um, and so that meant people looking to do a hub motor conversion were often needing to have slightly older bicycle frames and bike standards. Um, we're working hard to change that and to bring into the industry more through axle compatible hub motors so that hub motors can stay um, up to the speed of what's considered state of the art in the bike industry. Um, the other thing we've seen is a fairly significant change in the spacing, the width between these dropouts. Um, so it's still the case that, you know, inexpensive mountain bikes are 100 and 135. There's tons and tons of vehicles these days running fat bike tires and fat bike rims. And a fat tire needs a lot more room in order to not rub against the fork in order to clear the chain and the brakes. Um, so fat bikes will often have 150 or 135 millimeters on the front. And then the rear of a fat bike is anywhere from 175 to 195 millimeters. Um, so a much larger uh, width that's required for the hub and for the axle. Um, and then on the opposite end of that, you have sometimes folding bikes that are as skinny as 75 millimeters in dropout spacing. Um, so when you're selecting a hub motor for an application, of course, it's of vital importance that the hub motor fits in the width of the dropout and with the axle standard that's on the bicycle frame. And that can influence substantially the type of frame that you build or that you source for your project um, if the motor that you have is only available on one of these standards. Um, there's another question regarding brake compatibility, and quite often we see people retrofitting bikes or wanting to use bikes that have drum brakes in them, for instance. Um, and uh, in general, most of the hub motors available now have mounts for disc rotors and are disc brake compatible, and you greatly simplify or expand your motor options if you make sure that your bike has disc brakes on it as well. Um, and then with rear motors, there's another small compatibility question between systems using the cassette free hub system for adding the gears or a threaded freewheel, which is the older standard. And a lot of hub motors on the market still use a threaded freewheel standard, even though virtually the entire bike industry has shifted to these spline free hubs. Um, and uh, this is something to be mindful of if you're dealing with a bike that has a modern drivetrain, say a 10 or 11. Um, oftentimes now they're running one by chain system, so you'll have uh, only a single chain ring at the front and then you make up for that by a very high quantity of gears at a high ratio on the rear and those are only available for these cassette free hub bodies they're not available in threaded free wheels um, so uh, yeah those are some of the um, mechanical considerations for choosing a motor or choosing a frame to match the motor that you have um, there's a really another significant mechanical consideration with hub motors and that's related to the anti-rotation torque that you have to deal with. So while the action of a motor wants the hub to spin forwards, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And what that causes is, is the axle to want to spin backwards. And the axle want to spin backwards with a very significant force. These motors are generating you know, 40, 50, sometimes upwards of 80 or 100 newton meters of torque. Um, to put in perspective, when you're tightening with a wrench and pulling kind of with all your might, that's like 60 to 70 newton meters. Um, and so there's this enormous twisting force present on the axle. And if you don't do anything to prevent the axle from twisting, it will spin its way out. Um, and while it's twisting, it will then wrap the cable harness that comes out of the axle around itself, cut and damage all the wires, 
and then uh, either rip the wheel off the bike or cause the bike to come to a very quick halt in its forwards motion. Um, and so the importance of mechanically locking that axle against rotation is a key part of hub motor uh, design and installation. Um, and it's, this isn't just unique to hub motors. If you have internal gear hubs, or if you have a bicycle with a coaster brake, anytime there's a torque transmission through the hub on a bicycle or other vehicle, you need something to lock the axle against the, um, uh, uh, the counter torque that's present there. So these axle spin-outs are no, not a fun thing to deal with. And it's really important when you're designing or installing a hub motor that you take into consideration that you've locked the axle against that kind of rotation. And the cheap and common uh, means with which these axles are designed to not spin is by putting flat surfaces on them. So with these two flat surfaces that are 10 millimeters apart, that fits inside the slot of the bicycle frame and then that effectively locks it against twisting. But it doesn't lock it with nearly the amount of integrity that some of the more powerful motors need. And this illustration at the bottom shows what happens. When the axle is trying to twist backwards here, it pushes on the face of the, the dropout slot, and it pushes it with enough force. If you calculate it at the torque levels of a motor, this ends up being anywhere from one to 2,000 pounds of spreading force pulling that metal face open. Um, and if there isn't something to retain that axle, it will then uh, actually spread open or break the, deform the metal and, and cause the spin out problem that I just discussed. Um, so the common solution with axle flats uh, will in many situations fail at somewhere around 40 to 50 Newton meters of torque. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that we did early on in our development at Grin Tech was <laughs> um, run into these problems both on our own builds and certainly builds that some of our customers had. And we really wanted to understand and characterize just what were the thresholds where forks were failing and, um, and quantify how much of an improvement we can produce with torque arms. So we built a lot of simple jigs where we were pulling on a, a lever arm, they would twist the axle while we mounted different brands or models of torque arm, installed them in different types of fork, and generated lots of different graphs or plots where we were measuring how much torque it took. This here is the angle of the axle, um, and how much torque it took before the axle started to spin and twist at a position. And what we saw was a, a huge amount of variety in that. So there were some forks um, where this would happen at 40 newton meters, some would go 90 to 100 newton meters. Uh, the amount that you tightened up the nuts played a very significant role in it, um, but it meant that with the motors generating torque that was also in this range of 30 to 60 newton meters, there is in many cases minimal or no margin of safety to prevent this kind of spin out problem. Um, so whenever you're dealing with a, a motor that has power levels that are, I would say, over 40 to 50 newton meters, then you definitely, definitely need additional. Uh, anti-rotation, some kind of torque arm above and beyond just relying on the dropout slots. Um, this here shows uh, for the lower power motors, when I showed you those, those geared in-runner and out-runner motors, oftentimes they're limited and won't be doing more than maybe 30 to 40 newton meters with the particular motor controller that they're paired with. Um, and these are very clever uh, torque arm designs. Uh, because it doesn't require extra hardware that you clamp onto the frame. Uh, what these tab washers do is they slide over the flat part of the axle, but then they engage this little tab. Uh, sorry, I keep using the pointer in the wrong place. Uh, this little tab here um, engages with the slot further away than the axle flats would. So it's sort of giving a, an extra lever arm uh, to push against the metal of the dropout. And that substantially increases the spin out strength over just using the axle flats themselves. Um, and so here you can see different uh, spin out tests with the tab washer on different styles of fork. Um, this here is an aluminum fork. Um, you can see that as we torque the axle, we 10, 20, 30, 40, absolutely no twisting takes place until you hit 50 Newton meters. And then the torque arm failed quite, <laughs> quite dramatically. And then we see it just spun out um, and then now we have no protection whatsoever. Um, when we did the same kind of test with a steel fork, um, we see a little bit of a more gradual failure, but we also see a peak spin out resistance is quite a bit higher. So this here is just a simple tab washer in this particular model of steel fork, and it was able to go right up to 100 Newton meters before it actually spread open to the point of, of no return. Um, in this region here, this is where the, the, the fork uh, the dropout has spread open plastically. So if, if we were to take the wheel out, we would see it would be open in kind of a V shape, um, having gone through here, but it wouldn't have actually 
uh, come out of the wheel and cause that wire spinning out problem. Um, but and before you make any generalizations, this experiment here was also done with the steel fork. Um, and in this particular steel fork, it started to fail at about 30 Newton meters. Uh, so even before the aluminum fork. So some people make broad generalizations of aluminum or steel, um, but we see a lot of variation just from fork to fork. Um, and usually as long as you're below 40 Newton meters, you can get away with it. In some cases with a good margin of safety, in some cases it's not much. Um, with anything above that, you definitely want a torque arm. Um, so one of the things that we used to see in the very early hub motors that were on the market, uh, I would say the Tidal Force, the Heinzmann, um, these motors from the early 2000s that were made in America and Germany, they all had a torque arm that was built right into the motor. Um, and they weren't using those flat axles that we saw in the uh, imported motors from China. Um, part of our goal is to bring back these integrated torque arms as being the norm for hub motor systems. Uh, because it provides much, much better uh, um, spin-out protection capability um, than you can ever get with axle flats. Um, and it can allow for a much more elegant installation because now you have a separate piece of hardware that connects to your uh, bicycle frame much further downstream than um, what you have with the, the torque arms or a tabbed loss installation. Um, so we're hoping more and more industry players uh, do this and sort of have the torque arm part of the motor design itself not so much just an afterthought or something that goes on after the fact these integrated torque arms also simplify installing and removing the hub motor because the torque arm just comes on and off with it you don't have to separately remove a torque arm and then reinstall it when you put the wheel back on if you're fixing a flat tire or doing other maintenance um, uh, this motor that i'm showing you here so this is our, our gmac this is a geared motor that produces very high um, uh, torque capabilities this is a direct drive motor um, both of these are aluminum torque arms, but because they use a splined pattern at a larger diameter to the hub interface, uh, they have much, much more spin out than a steel torque arm that's working just at the axle flats. Um, in this motor here, this one, if I showed you the bottom of the picture, this is a case where a customer actually had spin out, um, and it wasn't that the torque arm failed, but the way in which this person attached the torque arm to the frame of their bicycle was with a P-clamp. Um, so that's a, a metal strap that sort of does a hoop, um, a P-shaped hoop around the tubing. P-clamps like this are really commonly used in bicycles, in torque arms, in internal gear hubs, or in, in drum brakes, or in coaster brakes. Um, and they work pretty well if the force is always in tension, if you're always pulling in the same direction. Uh, what happens in this case, this customer is using a motor with regenerative braking, and so the torque arm would wiggle a little bit forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, uh, flexing this uh, stainless steel strap. And if you flex the metal repeatedly back and forth, it eventually fatigue fails and cracks. Um, and so after about uh, eight months of use, this P-clamp cracked, the thing spun out, the wires were severed, and we had to uh, rebuild his cable harness. Um, so it's important that the torque arms attachment not only to the axle is secure, uh, but of course also to the frame of the bicycle. Um, so these spline design integrated torque arms, uh, uh, we've been experimenting with a fair bit and testing their spin out strength capabilities. Um, and here you can see the, the torque arm for the uh, all axle motor. Our early designs were getting up to about 150 Newton meters before we were having failures. Um, and then we were identifying what were the, the weak points as we looked at and examined the, um, the mode at which they, they ended up coming loose. Um, and then uh, after a few revisions, we were getting them up to about 250 to 300 Newton meters of torque. And that kind of number, 250, 300 Newton meters, should give us a much greater sense of safety um, that our margin now is about a factor of three more than kind of the worst case torque of these motors, which is 100 Newton meters. Um, whereas the sort of more traditional torque arms often have margins of safety that are more 20 to 50%. Um, and that is, um, it doesn't inspire the same kind of confidence um, and uh, is not really the best engineering practice. And um, this is our testing where we were testing the GMAC torque arm. Um, and in the GMAC torque arm, uh, we also wanted to see um, what its behavior was like with the torque changing direction, going forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Um, here you can see up to about 150 Newton meters, um, it always went back to the same position. Um, but once we started getting beyond 150 Newton meters, then we were seeing a little bit of deformation in the um, 
of uh, uh, plastic deformation of the metal. So even though it wasn't failing, it wasn't returning quite back to the same angle that it had started at. And here we see about a two degree shift in the angle, uh, but this torque arm made it again up to just about 350 newton or 300 newton meters. Um, so that's a sort of summary of the mechanical things to know about uh, when it comes to uh, hub motor uh, installation. Um, what I want to go into now is going to get uh, delve quite a bit more into the technical, uh, but this is a topic that I've wanted to get into at some <laughs> for some time because there's a lot of misunderstanding with some of the tools that we offer on our website with our motor simulators and trip simulators in understanding the meanings and in understanding um, what these graphs, what their output kind of means. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to delve into um, uh, elementary direct drive motor theory, and I'm going to assume that uh, you have at least an Ohm's law understanding of electronic circuitry. Um, if you don't understand it, hopefully some of this stuff will still be digestible. Um, but for people who have a basic circuit knowledge, but we often find people have a, an adequate understanding of electronics. They know how to calculate how many amps is going to flow with the given voltage and a given resistance, uh, but they don't really know how that applies to motors. Um, and I'm hoping that with this explanation, those who have a basic understanding of electricity can actually now look at the curves from, the, from our motor simulator tools um, and know exactly where those are coming from. Um, so almost all the hub motors used inside bicycles are running permanent magnet motors. And permanent magnet motors are actually the easiest to understand and to model. Um, so even though they, these are brushless motors, they're three phases, um, from an electric circuit analysis, you can very easily to first order treat them exactly like a DC motor. Um, and a DC motor has sort of a wonderfully orthogonal properties. Um, the, uh, in a direct right current motor, if you were just to take a motor and then hold the shaft so it's stalled and then start feeding current through the motor, you put amps through the motor, you're gonna measure a torque on the shaft of that motor. And that torque increases perfectly linearly with the amperage that you're putting through the motor winding. So if you crank up this current from five amps to 10 amps, 15 amps, 20 amps, the torque on the motor is gonna increase in a one-to-one -one lock step ratio at that. So this graph that you see here is me explicitly measuring the torque of one of these motors as I put current through the windings with the power supply. And you can see that that plot is as straight a line as you could imagine. Um, where it starts to deviate right up and around this sort of 80 to 100 amp region is because there we get to a point of uh, saturation where we're now putting so much current through the motor winding that we're, um, we're potentially demagnetizing the magnets or uh, running into saturation of the steel core. Um, but in practice, you really uh, rarely run the motors at that point where they're, you're in the nonlinear region and you can treat it as a nice straight line relationship. Uh, so the other really cute thing about DC motors is that if instead of putting amps through the motor um, and, uh, and measuring the torque, you spin the motor and measure the voltage, you get another wonderful linear relationship. Um, so if you take the motor, hook it up to a drill or, or spin it by hand, and then measure the voltage on the terminals of the motor. So in this schematic here, if we're spinning the motor, we'd be putting you know, a multimeter across these two points um, of the motor terminals we would then see it uh, produce a voltage. Uh, this graph is a little bit inverted from <laughs> how it normally show up, but here as you spin the motor at 300 RPM, it produces you know, 22 volts. You spin the motor at 500 RPM, it's producing 40 volts. Um, and that relationship holds perfectly straight right down to zero. Um, so you have a voltage that varies directly proportional to the RPM and a torque that's directly proportional to the amps that flow through it. So that bit is fairly simple to understand. Um, and putting that into an equation form, uh, the torque of a motor is some constant times the current through the motor. So we're gonna call that constant KT, the, the motor torque constant. Um, and the voltage of the motor, so if you spin the motor at a given RPM and measure the voltage, that's gonna be just proportional to the, um, uh, another constant called the KV. And the, KV is usually expressed, it's funny, I look at this now and I realize I've got, uh, I've got my equation inverted. And normally we express the KV in terms of RPM per volt. Um, so this, um, this KV is not quite the same as that KV. I'll fix this slide at a later point. Um, but, uh, but in any case, you have two constants, one of them that's relating the, um, the torque to the amperage and another co constant that's relating the voltage of the motor to how fast it's spinning. Um, and if you do a derivation on this, um, or if you apply 
you know, principles of conservation of energy, or if you think about it a bit logically, that both of these relations, both of these are a result of the same electromagnetic interactions, these two coefficients are directly related to each other. And if you express your KV, your motor uh, speed constant in RPM per volt, then the motor torque constant is 9.55 divided by that KV. Um, so that means that all you really need to know is one of these things. And the most common uh, motor constant to deal with in this industry is the RPM per volt, because uh, that's in units that we can really easily understand. But if you know the RPM per volts for a motor, you also know exactly how much torque that motor is producing for a given amount of amps flowing through it. Um, and so, uh, this KV constant tells us how fast the motor will spin for a given battery voltage, and it tells us how much torque we're going to get when there's a given current that's flowing through it. And this relationship, and this is a little counterintuitive to people, um, but it holds perfectly true no matter how big or small the motor is. So if you have a motor that's round for 8 RPM per volt, so 8 RPM per volt is a very typical speed for a bicycle hub motor, um, that motor will also produce 1.2 Newton meters of torque for every amp that's flowing through it. Um, and that's true for like, you know, a giant, huge 10 kilo hub motor. It's true for a tiny little geared motor. If you were to put, you know, 10 amps through this motor, you're gonna get 12 Newton meters. And it doesn't matter if it's a big or a small motor, if it has eight RPM per volt, it's always gonna produce 12 Newton meters for 10 amps of current flow. Um, so then what, is different. Why would you use a big motor if a small motor will produce the same torque for the same amount of current? Um, and the big difference between these two, a small motor and a big motor, is how much resistance there is, electrical resistance, inside the motor windings. Um, so here we're using examples of putting 10 amps of current. Um, that current needs to flow through the winding resistance. And anytime you have current flowing through a resistor, it generates heat. Um, and the heat that it generates is I squared R. So again, back to uh, first order electrical familiarity. Um, so a big motor here, I use an example, the crystallite crown motor. Um, this motor has a winding resistance of 0 0.07 ohms. So when we put that 10 amps of current through it, 10 amps squared is 100, 100 times 0 0.07 gives us just seven watts of heat. So this huge motor, in order to produce um, how many Newton meters is that? That was 12 Newton meters. Um, in order to produce 12 Newton meters, it's only absorbing seven watts of power or generating seven watts of heat. Now, if you wanted to make 12 Newton meters from this tiny direct drive motor, this is a crystallite NSM motor, well, this motor has a resistance of 0 0.65 ohms. So that's almost 10 times as much resistance as the big motor. So 10 amps flowing through this little motor produces 65 watts of heat. Um, so now what we have is a smaller motor that's producing almost 10 times as much heat. Um, so that means obviously the motor is uh, going to be running less efficiently, um, but a small motor also has less ability to get rid of that heat. So this little motor will overheat much, much faster than the big motor when it's producing that same 12 Newton meters. Um, so the fundamental difference between big and small motors isn't the Newton meters cramp or the winding constant, it's the amount of electrical resistance you have for that winding constant. Um, so a big motor can have, generates less heat, and it also has more surface area, more metal to absorb that heat and to shed it. And that's the difference between a powerful motor and a not powerful motor. Okay, um, so the primary uh, source of heat that causes motors to, to overheat or, or reach their kind of limits is from that copper loss, from putting amperage through the windings in order to make torque. Um, but there's another source of heat loss inside the motor uh, from the motor core. And the core losses are losses inside mostly the steel laminations, and they come from two sources. Um, so one of the sources of core loss, which is usually the, the, the primary one, is hysteresis loss. And what happens when a motor is spinning is that the steel inside it's getting magnetized. It gets magnetized in one direction, and then as the magnets move over, the steel gets magnetized in the other direction. And every time you switch the orientation of these magnetic domains, you lose a little bit of energy to heat. It's almost kind of like friction as these magnetic domains realign themselves, pointing one way, pointing the other way. Um, and that drag that you get from, from changing the magnetic orientation um, is a hysteresis loss. And it's basically constant with RPM. So whether you spin the motor slowly or if you spin the motor fast, it's the same amount of drag that it produces on the hub um, 
uh, from this hysteresis change. Um, but if you have a, a motor with many more magnets on it, where it's changing more frequently, then, the, then that more frequent change results in a higher drag um, than you would if you had fewer magnets on it. Um, the other source of core loss are eddy currents. And an eddy current happens whenever you have moving magnetic fields near anything that conducts electricity. And those moving magnetic fields induce electric currents inside the metal. And so those currents circulate, they flow in circles, they don't do anything useful, um, but as the current flows, it generates heat. Um, and uh, these eddy current losses, unlike the hysteresis losses, they, the drag that they produce in the hub increases with the RPM because if it spins faster, you get a faster changing magnetic field, a faster changing magnetic field induces a higher voltage um, and a higher voltage results in uh, higher amperage and the, you know, the power goes as V squared over R. Um, and uh, so you get these two different terms that also contribute to heat inside the motor. Um, and how do those losses stack up? Um, so here I've actually got measured losses. So this is how much drag torque we have from inside the core of a motor. Um, on the left graph here, we have a direct drive motor. And what I've shown you here, this is actually the same motor. It's a, uh, this is a prototype of our, our Grin motor. Um, and in the case of the top, this is with an early version of a, of a stator from China where the thickness of the lamination, so these are sort of metal laminations that the copper's wound around, uh, are 0 0.5 millimeters. And in a newer stator, that lamination thickness was 0 0.35. So it was thinner, which inhibits the ability of those circulating currents to flow. And it was also a higher grade of steel. Um, and you can see that in a direct drive motor here, the torque was, um, you know, at low RPMs, it's somewhere around 0.6 Newton meters. Um, and then as the um, wheel spins faster, the amount of drag increases. And the slope of this drag is determined by those eddy current losses. And the intersection, where does this, what is this drag at zero RPM? That's determined entirely by the hysteresis losses. Um, in a geared motor, the inside of a geared motor, because it's got that five to one or 10 to one gear ratio, it's spinning at a way higher RPM. And because the core losses um, increase with RPM, you wind up getting a higher percentage or higher amount of effective drag inside a geared motor than you do in a direct drive motor. Um, so here we're showing with the Easy Hub motor, which is kind of comparable power to these direct drive ones, um, and it's up more in the sort of 1.5 meter range. Um, and if you have a really tiny little geared motor, it typically has similar core losses to these big direct drive hub motors. Um, and the core losses are lower still when you have motors with fewer magnets. So um, some of the direct drive motors like the early Bionics hub um, have only 22 magnets or 11 pole pairs, and they had exceptionally low um, cogging drag, low drag to spin the wheel, um, but there's downsides to fewer magnets that, uh, that result in, in sort of a heavier motor uh, requirement for a given torque. Um, so those are the two sources of losses inside a motor. So what I'm going to go uh, with that information now is try to explain where do these motor output curves come from. Um, and so in our, in our online simulator web tool, you know, we generate a, a simulated version of a dyno curve. Um, and uh, what I want to get at here is what, uh, effectively, we're going to construct one of those dyno curves uh, numerically from scratch. Um, so what I've done here is I've, we're just, let's imagine, let's just invent a motor. And let's say this motor has 10 RPM per volt for winding speed. So it's maybe a, a little bit on the fast side of a typical hub motor. And let's assume that this motor, you know, we made our own motor and it has 0 0.3 ohms of resistance in the winding. Um, so the model of our motor is quite simple. It's got a resistor that's 0.3 ohms, and it has a voltage source um, that creates a voltage directly in proportion to the RPM of the motor. And the voltage source in our little motor here um, has a coefficient of 10 RPM per volt. Um, so uh, if the motor is spinning at 100 RPM, then we know we're going to have 10 volts being generated by this motor. Um, so let's now connect our motor that we that we just manifest on paper here uh, to a 36 volt battery pack. Uh, 36 volts is a very common voltage to run in the e-bike industry. Um, we plug that motor in. There'd be like a large you know jolt as the motor gets up to speed, and within a split second, the motor's just spinning away. Um, there's no resistance, so we just have the motor sitting on our bench. Um, and what we notice if we look at the motor is that it's spinning to 357 rpm. Okay, so we've plugged in a 36 volt battery, 
Um, and, uh, and then the motor is now spinning at 357 RPM. Well, from that information, we can calculate what is the back EMF voltage of this motor. Um, if it's spinning at 357 RPM and it's 10 RPM per volt, then of course it's generating 35.7 volts. So if a motor is generating 35.7 volts and there's 36 volts from the battery, those two voltages are in opposition to each other. So that means that we only have 0 0.3 volts um, left over, so 36 minus 35.7, there's only 0 0.3 volts left over to push current through the resistance of the motor. As a result, if we have 0.3 volts pushing current through here over a 0.3 ohm resistance, we get exactly one amp flowing. So this hypothetical motor sitting on our bench it is now spinning away, um, drawing one amp from the battery pack. The output of the motor, since it's, there's no load on it, it's just spinning freely in air, it's generating zero watts of power. But if we look at what's going into the motor, we have one amp flowing from the battery pack at 36 volts. One amp times 36 volts gives us 36 watts of power that we're dumping into it. So where's all that power going? It's not coming out in terms of useful mechanical power, it's all going into heat in the motor. Um, and almost all of that is going into core losses, what I talked about, the, um, the eddy current and the hysteresis losses. So the efficiency at this point is 0%, there's 36 watts going in, zero watts coming out. Okay, so now what we're gonna do in our little uh, benchtop motor here is put some drag resistance on it. So instead of it spinning freely, I'm now gonna grab it and try to slow it down with my fingers. And as I do that, as I slow down the RPM, what starts to happen is uh, A, my fingers start to burn because that's a lot of friction. Um, but now instead of seeing one amp flowing out of the battery pack, I'm seeing more and more amperage flow. So say I, say I put as much friction as my hands can bear and we see the motor spinning at 345 RPM. Um, so now at 345 RPM, we know that the generated voltage from this motor is 34.5 volts. So that means that there's one and a half volts left over to force current through the resistance of the motor. And if we have one and a half volts flowing over 0.3 ohms uh, by Ohm's law, um, that's gonna give us five amps of current flow. <laughs> um, uh, so now we have five amps flowing through this motor. We can now have some fun calculations with this. If there's five amps flowing, we know that some of that current is generating heat inside the copper. And we can calculate that with I squared R, five squared times 0.3 is 7.5 watts. So now we have 7.5 watts of heat inside the motor. Um, the core loss is, like what are we losing to the magnetics and everything? Um, I, would, uh, I didn't explain exactly the rationale for this, but since the motor is slowed down a little bit to 345 RPM, instead of us having 36 watts like we did last time, um, where there's 36 watts in the core, um, it's a little bit less because it's spinning at a slightly lower speed. So now there's 34.5 watts um, inside, the, the inside the steel. Um, and the output power of the motor, we know that we're putting in 180 watts. We're losing seven and a half watts to copper, 34.5 to the steel. So we're gonna have 138 watts of output power. Um, if there's 138 watts of mechanical power, so that's all power that's you know, going into friction in my hands as I slow this thing down, uh, we can now calculate the efficiency of the motor. It's generating 136 watts, there's 180 going in, so it's 76% efficient. We can also calculate how much torque the motor is producing. So the torque of the motor uh, is normally the amperage flowing times this motor constant, or uh, the amperage five amps times the updated motor constant, which is 9.55 divided by the kV, um, the 10 RPM per volt. Um, so in this case, it's 0.955 Newton meters per amp. Um, but instead of the, the, the torque produced by the motor is five times this value, but one amp of that torque generating current is being used by, is being taken by the core just to, to overcome the drag um, inside the steel itself. Um, so it leaves us just 3.8 Newton meters of actual torque on the output. 3.8 Newton meters is not a lot of torque for an e-bike. Um, that's about the torque if you're you know, using a screwdriver <laughs> and just tightening something by hand. That's kind of like the limit of what you can do with your wrist. Um, but it is not insignificant. And uh, 180 watts, 130 watts of power is you know, comparable to an uh, average person cycling without too much effort. Um, so now we continue down this trend. Let's put even more resistance on this motor. And we slow it all the way down to 330 RPM. Well, at 330 RPM, we're generating 33 volts. 
uh, of vacuum F voltage. That leaves us three volts across this resistance. Three volts across the resistance gives us 10 amps flowing. 10 amps of current, of course, means more heat being generated in the resistor. Um, so now if we have 10 amps to 0.3 ohms, that's 30 watts of copper losses. Um, our core loss, I made a little mistake, is a little bit lower here. Um, it's actually 33 watts, not 36. I, I did the calculation right there. Um, so now we have 360 watts, 10 amps of 36 volts going in. We're losing 33 watts uh, to the um, to the core, 30 watts to the copper. So our output power is just under 300 watts, efficiency of 82.5%. Um, and by knowing how much current is flowing, 10 amps minus one because of the core losses times the Newton meters per amp, we know exactly how much torque there is, 8.6 Newton meters. Uh, one thing that uh, is maybe not easy to believe from this is that um, we're able to determine the torque of the motor without actually measuring the torque. Um, so when we understand this motor model, you can do a lot of derivations and assumptions without the complexity of actually dynoing to measure the torque output. The torque output is a given based on how many amps are flowing, and the relation of those amps to the generated torque is a constant for the motor that you know from the RPM per volt. Um, if you continue doing this, say you've really put a massive load on the motor, um, and you slow it right down to 180 RPM. So now it's spinning at half the speed that it would have been spinning uh, when it was just freely spinning without any resistance. Well, now we have 18 volts um, across the resistor here um, with 18 volts over 0.3 ohms is 60 amps flowing. Now we're talking way more serious current. Um, 60 amps of current flowing into the system from our 36 volt battery means 2,160 watts. But a huge chunk of that now, 1,080 watts, is being burned up by copper losses. So basically half the power that we're dumping into this motor is getting, uh, is just turning into heat. It's like the copper windings are becoming a, a, a toaster element. Um, and our core losses, the amount of heat being generated from the steel, is just an insignificant 18 watts. Um, so as we really like load down a motor this way, the copper losses start to become a very dominant effect. Um, the power output is still an impressive 1,000 watts. So um, this you know, little motor that we, that we you know, manifest is producing 1,000 watts. You could say, oh, we have a 1,000 watt motor, um, and it is legitimately generating 1,000 watts here, but it's doing it at a pretty abysmal efficiency. Um, so 1,000 watts of output power with 2,000 watts of input is just under 50%, um, and it's making 56 Newton meters of torque. And this is a torque level that is, you know, well, enough to spin out an axle inside a dropout, um, and uh, it's what you would have, you know, with a very long wrench tightening up. Not a very long wrench, like imagine a 12-inch wrench tightening up a nut pretty hard. Um, if you just take this right to the extreme and you stall the motor, you completely lock it. Well, now it becomes a really simple equation. The back EMF voltage, um, huh, I, <laughs> this should say zero volts. Um, uh, so now we have all 36 volts is dumped through this motor with no back EMF voltage. This is zero volts, ignore the 18 there. Um, so now we would have um, 36 volts divided by 0.3 ohms is 120 amps. Um, 120 amps of current is 4,000 watts. The motor is not spinning, so there's no output power at all. Um, the copper losses, if you calculate them, are also exactly 4,300 watts. So now we have a 0% efficiency. But as we stall this motor, it's putting 113 Newton meters of torque. Um, if we were to present all of those data points in graphical form, it looks exactly like this. And this is what a motor dyno curve would look like if all you were characterizing was the motor itself. So if you take a motor and you apply a given voltage to it and then slow that motor down, the torque, this blue line here, increases perfectly linearly. So as the motor slows down from its unloaded speed, it generates more and more torque. And it does that in a directly linear fashion. The power of the motor initially gets higher and higher and higher because we have more torque. But that additional torque is also making more and more copper losses. And at one point, which is usually around half the unloaded speed of the motor, the output power actually starts to decrease. So even though the motor is generating more torque and the input power is increasing, the output power is going down. Um, and all of this is reflected easily in the efficiency curve, which as you can see, gets worse and worse and worse as we end up slowing down the motor. So this is what a 
theoretical and the, and the practical motor curve would look like if all you were testing was the motor. Um, in reality, if this was a, a, you know, a hub motor with these, these characteristics, this area over here is where the motor would be in its sort of happy operating zone. If you were to use the motor over here, it wouldn't last more than tens of seconds or minutes before it cooks. And if you were to load the motor this way, so this is where we're putting 4,000 watts into this core hub motor, um, you would have you know, seconds before you see smoke start coming out before the insulation starts to vaporize. So the actual characterization of a motor in a system almost never looks like this because you never, uh, <laughs> you never load the motor without any additional controls. You never run a motor without any additional controls in place. So this is where to really understand the curve, the dyno curve or the simulator curve, you really have to appreciate and know what the motor controller does. Because in the end, it's actually the motor controller more than the motor that sort of defines what the simulation curve looks like in a given setup. Um, and the easiest way to understand motor controllers uh, don't think about the three phase or that it's commutating with Hall sensors and that it's following the RPM of the motor. All you need to do to understand electrically what a motor controller does in the system is treat it as a step down DC to DC converter. Um, so if you've done any kind of electronics, a DC to DC converter is something that takes one voltage on the input and outputs a different voltage. And forever, for the amount that it outputs, that the voltage changes, the current changes in the opposite direction. So a motor controller is a step-down DC to DC converter. So what it does is it takes the battery voltage, which in our case was 36 volts in that demo, and then it enables that battery voltage to be reduced before it goes to the motor. And when it reduces the voltage, it also increases the amperage that's flowing. So in this uh, drawing right here where I have a motor controller, so the previous one I just had the battery directly connected to the motor. With a motor controller in here, we can have a situation that looks like this. There's 36 volt battery, 36 volts going into the motor controller, and 10 amps of current flowing out of the battery pack. So if you put on an amp meter on your battery, or you look at the amps on a cyclonus, you'll see 10 amps flowing. The motor controller is reducing that from 36 volts down to 24 volts. And when it reduces it to 24 volts to the motor, it increases the amperage that the motor has up to 15 amps. So that the amount that the voltage went down, the amperage went up. You don't see this 15 amps in the system because you can't easily measure the amperage flowing into a motor. Um, but it's important to know that the amperage in the motor is not the same as the amperage flowing out of the battery pack that you measure. So what I've done here is taken that exact same curve that we had here, and I added into the system a 25 amp motor controller. So now the curve up until this point looks exactly the same. There's no difference at all to what we had uh, when we tested the motor just with the battery pack. Um, but suddenly at 280 RPM here, the curve takes a sudden change in shape. Instead of the power going up, 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 peaking over here and then coming down over there, the power immediately is peaked at this point. Um, and then below this, we're having much less torque. Instead of the torque increasing in a straight line, the torque is now increasing in this much gentler curve. Um, and so in this region, the power into the system is being limited by the 25 amp battery current limit of the controller. 25 amps and a 36 volt battery pack is 900 watts. So now instead of us having 4,000 watts going into the motor when we stall it, the motor controller is limiting us to 900 watts. During this entire region here, it's 900 watts going into the motor. Um, even though the battery amperage is limited to 25, the motor amperage continues to increase a little bit. Because what's going on here, as, as we're slowing the motor further down, the motor controller is continues to reduce the voltage that it's sending to the motor. And as it reduces the voltage it's sending to the motor, the amperage is increasing. So even though the 20, this here stays a constant 25 amps, this here is ramping upwards. And we see that in this blue line, which is the torque of the motor. Um, and, uh, and it steadily increases, but it gets here, it gets to a maximum of 50 Newton meters, which is way less than when we had no motor controller and allowed things to get to hundred Newton meters. Um, so this is what, if you've played with our online simulator tool, this is the kind of graph that you'll typically see. This is the region where there's no limits. The, the power of the motor is just determined by the voltage of the battery pack. And here the power is being limited by the motor controller. Um, and how does that compare in practice? Uh, so I've done hundreds and hundreds of dyno tests on all different motors. 
Um, and for the most part, this you know, theoretical model here exactly matches what I measure when I put a motor controller with a motor on a bench. Um, and so the dots here are the measured values that I get um, for the efficiency of the motor. The blue line here is what I measure with a very accurate strain gauge torque sensor as the output torque of the motor. Uh, this green line here is the amperage, the, the battery amperage flowing into the motor controller. Um, and the red line here is the output power um, that we're measuring. So how many Newton meters of torque times the RPM that we're getting. Um, and so the origin of this curve uh, is, comes from the combination of the, the natural motor curve and then the amperage limit of the battery pack, or the, the, the battery limit of the motor controller. Um, so here's where things are a little bit interesting, um, is that a lot of people read much too much into these dyno curves. Uh, and so we frequently have customers asking us, oh, can you send me the dyno, can you send me the graph of the motor? And I actually have frequently asked to tell them, I can, but it's actually not gonna tell you much at all because the shape of this graph is less determined by the actual nature of the motor and more by the amperage limit of the motor controller and the voltage that you're running the test at. So if I take the same motor and test at a higher voltage or a lower voltage, I'm gonna have a very different intersection for the RPM here. And if I run a higher amperage or a lower amperage motor controller, I'm gonna change the position of this curve, how much the torque is uh, um, varies with RPM in this region. So as an example here, I've created uh, two dyno curves, and I, I, this, I, this would have been fun to do on my dyno bench too, but I used our simulator because uh, uh, of time limitations. Um, but here you see two dyno curves superimposed on each other. Um, so we've got two systems, system A and system B. System A is a massive direct drive motor. So this is the one that I showed in the earlier scene that's 10 kilograms. Um, and uh, and uh, system B, uh, the other one here, is a small little geared motor. And what I've done is I've shown the dyno curves where I've chosen two motors that have the same RPM per volt, so they, they run at the same maximum speed, and I've run them in a system where they're running the same motor controller. So they're both running a 20 amp motor controller at 36 volts. And if you look, they have actually really similar looking curves. And looking at this, how would you know that this motor here, system A, is actually five times the size of this smaller geared motor and can produce you know, four times the you know, continuous power capability. You can't really glean that information from a curve like this. And this is something that I, that I uh, try to emphasize when the opportunities let us, um, but there's really not much a static or a sort of a, a time limited dyno curve actually can tell us about the meaningful capabilities of a motor because these big motors and these small motors actually give pretty similar looking um, outputs. Um, so this is all sort of a long lead into what I really want to get at to is, which is what are the actual limitations on what a hub motor can do. Um, and this is where when you're selecting hub motors for uh, e-bike applications and especially more unusual e-bike applications, you really want to know in advance if you're going to get into a system where the motor has a short life and fails or the converse where you overkill an engineer for a motor that's larger, heavier, and more expensive than you need in your application. So a dyno curve tells us the performance of a system, the performance of a given battery, a given motor controller, and a motor all together. And you can change the shape of this curve by changing any one of those things. I can get more speed and more power with the same motor by just running higher voltages and running a higher amperage limit. Um, or I could get more speed by just using the same family of motor and using a faster motor winding inside it. Um, and, uh, but to know if you're going to hit an actual limitation, then you need a, a deeper understanding of the capabilities of these motors. And that's what I'm going to get into for the rest of this discussion here. Um, so there's two fundamental limits that you can hit when you're sort of seeing what is the most I can get from a motor. Uh, one of those, so those are mechanical limitations and thermal limitations. So mechanical limitations are pretty straightforward. Um, some of these might come a little bit surprising. The, the four most common mechanical failures that we see where a motor has been producing more torque than it should and something gives mechanically, um, number one, of course, would be the gears. And so when you have a geared motor, they're almost always running nylon gear sets in there. Um, and there's some fundamental limit where the teeth on that gear will just shear off. And you can very predictably destroy a motor by putting more torque than the teeth are able to handle. Um, sometimes these teeth fail unrelated to them being stressed beyond their ratings and capabilities, but if you do push it, that's definitely something that's going to give at a known point. Um, 
Another thing that we see fail when motors are being pushed at a higher torque level than their mechanical design can handle are the uh, keys, keyways and key locks that are present in the motor in order to prevent these parts from uh, spinning. So in this case here, in the geared motors, there's often a piece of key stock that holds the planet carrier to the axle. And if there's so much torque on this motor um, that it exceeds the shear strength of that pin, then that shears right off. So we've had cases where this has been a, a mechanical failure component. Um, we've also seen clutches fail. So these geared motors have one-way clutches most of the time so that you can uh, spin the hub freely without any right drag when you're not using it. Um, and those hubs need to resist all of the torque when they're in their lock mode. Um, and if that torque exceeds what the clutch's capabilities are for, then the clutch itself might fail. So this is one where this clutch, in the original design, this steel ring um, was the same diameter all the way around here. Um, and so it was a very robust and overbuilt clutch. And it was also heavier than it needed to be. Uh, so here the manufacturer cut away some of that metal to make it lighter. Um, but they accidentally cut away that metal at one point where there's a high stress inside where the, the clutch ball ramp pushes on it. Um, and over time, with too high of a torque, that actually cracked the entire steel shell that holds the uh, spread clutch assembly together. Um, and we've even seen cases where there is so much torque that the, the torque of the motor is, of course, acting on the magnets, and the magnets then couple that to the steel stator, which is coupled to the spokes that spin the wheel. Um, if the magnets aren't glued very well, you can even have situations where the torque causes all of the magnet adhesive to shear off, and then the magnets will spin uh, freely inside the motor, sliding against the steel stator, um, against the steel rotor, uh, without actually turning the hub. Um, so there's uh, mechanical limitations from the strength of magnet adhesives, um, and we've seen a different situation with magnets on the in-runner motors. The magnets are then, um, if they're spun too fast, you can get centrifugal forces that actually throw the magnet and cause the glue to come off of it. Um, so those me mechanical limitations uh, are hopefully explained in the motor data sheet. Um, certainly for the geared motors, they usually publish a torque specification that has some safety margin built into it. Um, but the more common thermal limit that people encounter are thermal limits of hub. And so a thermal limit is when you just get the motor so hot that uh, something fails as a result of heat. Uh, so these are pictures of motors that have been overheated. Um, and a uh, dead giveaway of this, of course, is that the you know, once shiny copper enamel is now dark and black. Um, if that enamel gets so hot that it burns off, then it exposes the copper to short against each other. You can get shorts between the windings, shorts between the windings, and the steel laminations. Um, the heat like this, also you can see in this motor all of these streaks coming out of it. Um, that's uh, grease and plastic and various goop inside the motor that melted and then got flung out from the, the spinning hub. Um, we see cases where if it's not the enamel wiring inside, it's the insulation that covers the wire that goes into the motor axle. So this is a motor phase wire that's totally melted um, because the current heated up the wires so much that it melted the uh, insulation. And then if that gets bad, it'll melt right through and then the wires will short together. And then any number of problems can happen when you have shorted phase wires. Um, you can also get to a situation if the motor gets this hot where the heat transfers to the magnets and then the magnets become de demagnetized. Um, and when the magnets are demagnetized, the motor has a worse ability to produce torque for a given amount of current. Um, and then is more likely to heat up in the future because it needs more amperage to make the same torque that's required by the bike. So the problem with these thermal limits is that they're not well-defined or captured by a single number. So the thermal limits are ultimately what uh, sets the upper bounds on how small of a motor you can use in any given application. Um, but there isn't an easy way to just calculate or to look at a, a you know, rated watts or a certain number and figure out, is this motor going to overheat in my application or not? Um, and so in order to have an appreciation for um, uh, where these thermal limits come from and how our modeling tools work to tell you in a meaningful way whether or not you're going to hit it, I'm going to go into some detail explaining the whole thermal heat flow process. Um, so we showed in those earlier things that when you're dealing with high power levels, you get heat mostly made from copper losses. So in order to make torque on the motor, you have amps flowing through the phase wire um, and that amperage generates heat. And the heat that's made is proportional to the square of the current, I squared R. What that means is that if you go up a hill and now you need double the torque, you're actually making four times the heat inside the motor. Um, and this quadratic relationship is something that uh, 
can kind of catch people by surprise because you can have a system that is really well behaved, you know, climbing a 10% grade hill. Um, and then you think, yeah, the motor, it's, you know, warm to the touch. It only gets, you know, 70, 80 degrees inside, not a big problem. Um, so you think that you have some margin in there. And if you then go on a different trip where you're going up a 12% hill, and now you might have increased the heat as well, so you're carrying a bit more gear, so you're 20% heavier, um, that additional grade and that additional weight might mean that you have, you know, 50% more torque required from the motor. But if you have 50% more torque, uh, that means that you have 125% more heat being generated, right? So 1.5 squared is 2.25. Um, and so what used to be a 60 to 70 degree motor is now 140 or 150 degree motor. What gets worse about this is that as the motor gets hot like that, the resistance of the motor increases too. So copper gets more resistive when it's hotter. And so now for the same torque output, not on, for the same <laughs> I squared R, not only is the I increasing to the higher torque, now things are getting heavier. So the resistance is hotter as well. Um, so you can pretty quickly get to a thing where something that seemed in a comfortable safety zone, which is a little bit more low to demand is now uh, pushing beyond uh, a sustainable output for the hub. The really important thing to know about these thermal limits though is that they don't come into play right away. Um, when you run these motors at higher power and torque levels, initially almost all of that heat is being absorbed by the metal of the motor. Like the copper itself can absorb heat, it's ran around steel, the steel is connected to an aluminum stator support. All of those metal, all of those bits of metal uh, can absorb the heat that's coming off it and limit how quickly the temperature climbs up here. Um, as the motor gets hotter and hotter, then it starts to be able to shed that heat. So as the, the inside of the motor gets hot, it can then radiate or convect the heat to the casing of the motor. Um, once the casing of the motor has heat flowing into it, it then starts to get warm and it can conduct that heat over to the air outside. Um, that's a process that works on a time scale, and I, I, I mentioned it here, of somewhere between 20 to 60 minutes. Um, so if you're running a motor and the, or, you know, the predictions is that it's gonna get 100 degrees Celsius, um, it may take an hour of riding under those conditions before you reach 100 degrees Celsius. Um, this here is a plot where I've, I'm measuring the temperature of the motor. This here I have a, a direct drive motor with uh, 35 amps of phase current flowing through it. Um, and if you look at the time scale here, so here I'm, I was setting up an experiment where I was trying to get the motor up to 80 degrees Celsius, um, and it took 1,200 seconds. So that's, uh, I believe if my math is right, 20 minutes uh, of time just to reach 80 degrees Celsius. If we were gonna keep having this motor heat, say to 120 degrees, we might be talking 40 to 50 minutes. What's important to note about that is that um, that's a large margin of time safety that you have. If you're pushing, if you're running a motor at a, at, a, at a power level that it's gonna overheat, you can safely do that for a pretty substantial time window before it actually overheats. Um, so one of our goals, uh, one of my personal goals and our goals at GRIN was to not only understand these things conceptually, but understand them numerically and have really accurate models where we could say, not just in hand wavy terms and not just for a single point, but have an, a model that would let us predict under any given situations how hot the motor would get and how quickly it would rise up to that temperature. Um, so the heat generated inside the motor, we already calculated that. When we, when we showed you those graphs where we were you know, loading down the motor, we could calculate the, the copper losses and the core losses. You could get that from the motor data sheet. If you know the resistance of the motor, you know the KV constant, you know how much amps you need in order to make the torque that you need in your vehicle, and then you can calculate how much heat it's gonna generate. Um, but the question of how much the heat flows out of the motor is something that you can't easily calculate. The dynamics of, of heat flow involve uh, radiative heat flow, it involves convective heat flow, and the convective heat flow is not a fixed value, but it varies with the wind speed as well as the RPM of the motor. So the faster it's spinning and the faster you're moving through the air, the more effectively um, air can help uh, pull the heat away from the motor itself. Um, so we built uh, uh, many years ago our own wind tunnels so that we could get these values and measure them in a controlled environment and in a reproducible way um, so that we could compare one motor to the next and have at least a really good relative comparison from these different styles of motor models that are here. 
Um, so in this wind tunnel, it's not measuring the aerodynamics of the hub, um, but what's loaded on here are temperature sensors. It's a temperature sensor inside on the copper. Uh, there's infrared sensors that are measuring the, the temperature of the shell. Uh, there's a temperature sensor of the air itself so that we know what is the ambient temperature that we're comparing against. Um, and this let us run the motors, uh, injecting heat into the motors and looking in real time as the motors heat up and at what steady state temperature they reach with their with a given power input. And what that lets us do is calculate the uh, most important parameter, which is the thermal conductivity. Um, so thermal conductivity is a uh, the you know basic term of of thermodynamics, um, and a it's a measurement of how much uh, the the temperature will the, how much of a temperature difference you have between two objects when there's a given amount of heat of power flowing between them. Um, so it's expressed in watts per degree, and it's really simple. If you have a motor that has uh, two watts per degree of uh, heat transfer, then that means that um, if you're making, say, 100 watts of heat, uh, then 100 watts of heat divided by two watts per degree means we're going to have 50 watts of uh, 50 degrees of temperature difference between those two surfaces. Um, so this uh, thermal constant, the, the heat conductivity constant, varies with the speed and RPM of the motor. And here we have the measured plots that we get from our wind tunnel. So here you can see this here is with a bionics motor. Um, and at low speeds, it has about 0.8 uh, degrees per, or watts per degree of conductivity. And as the wheel moves faster and faster, that increases to about 1.4 watts per degree. Um, so say we wanted to estimate how hot is the motor, or uh, yeah, how hot is the motor gonna get um, in a, a given situation, let's say that we're running the bike at um, 30 kilometers an hour. Well, at 30 kilometers an hour, this motor has 1.2 watts per Kelvin of heat conductivity. Say that we calculate that there's 150 watts of copper and core losses when we're running at this 30 kilometer an hour speed. Um, now we can calculate 150 divided by 1.2. We can say it's gonna get 125 degrees above the air temperature outside. So if you were to run it in this, at this speed with 150 watts of power, you would expect that eventually the motor would be 120 to 5 degrees warmer than the air. So that would typically be like 150 Celsius. And that's right at the upper limit that you would want to have a motor. Um, here's a different direct drive motor. This is a Muxus hub motor. Um, you can see it's a, got a fair bit higher amount. It starts off more like 1.2 watts per degree at low speeds, and it gets all the way up to... Uh, you know, at 30 kilometers an hour, we're close to two watts per Kelvin. Um, and at 45, we get up to closer to 2.5. Um, so this curve here, the thermal conductivity of a motor as a function of the speed is the essential part of the equation to know how hot the motor will get in its steady state situation. Um, so once you understand that, um, if you wanna get a longer continuous power output of a motor, the only way that you can achieve that is to boost this limitation. If we were to increase how many watts per degree um, we can cool the motor, then we can increase how many watts we put into it uh, without it overheating. Um, and this is where there's been a lot of uh, fun innovations and improvisations from the do-it-yourself community. Um, because you, know, you can get a hub motor that does two kilowatts of power uh, for short duration, and it's fine, it performs well like that. Um, but if you tried to sustain that forever, eventually it would, would overheat. But there's no reason the motor fundamentally couldn't do that forever if only you were to able to continuously pull the heat away from it. Um, so one of the most obvious approaches to cooling a motor is just to put large holes in it so that the motor can breathe. Uh, so you give it a vent hole, and now as it's running, air can actually circulate into the motor directly instead of having this barrier where all the air in the motor is trapped and all the air out of the motor the outside air can never intermingle with the air inside it. Now you get intermingling of external air with the hot air inside it. Um, and doing this, uh, adding vent holes like this, to a first order, it roughly doubles the thermal conductivity. So if you had a motor that was giving you know, 1.2 watts per degree like that bionics, if we put big holes in both sides, it'd probably be about two and a half watts per degree, all else being the same. What that means, if we double the conductivity, is that the temperature rises only half as much. So now instead of the motor in that previous example being 150 degrees Celsius or 125 over ambient, it would be you know, 60 to 70 over ambient. Um, so more like 80 degrees Celsius or 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's a really dramatic improvement. And then it allows you to 
uh, run the motor harder, run the motor longer uh, without getting to the point where you have a thermal failure. Um, one of the things that people would be concerned about, of course, if you have big open holes in the motor, well, how are you going to protect against water getting inside the motor? Um, quite to uh, many people's surprise, ourselves as well, um, putting large holes in the motor like this almost <laughs> causes almost no additional vulnerability or incidence of water damage. Uh, because what we find is that uh, when you have large open holes like that, any water that gets in just as easily gets burnt and thrown out of the motor. So even people riding with holes in their motors like this, riding in rainy, wet conditions, riding through the winter, as long as they don't park their bike in the rain, um, they have no real problems with, with rust inside the hub. And sometimes they have fewer problems than people with a, a closed off motor, uh, which can trap the motor, trap water in the motor so that it never escapes. Um, but uh, there is more concern, if you, especially if you're riding in, a, in an area where there's lots of you know, dust storms or sand storms of getting actual grit and particles inside there, which could cause mechanical issues. Um, we don't typically see that happening with direct drive motors, um, but we would never, for instance, have a geared motor where we put these big openings because the intermeshing teeth of the gear have a much tighter tolerance to a small piece of dirt or sand getting in there and wrecking havoc. Um, the other kind of obvious approach for helping the cooling of a motor, and this is done in industrial motors all the time, is filling the motor with oil. Um, so in a hub motor, you wouldn't want to fill it all the way with oil, but you'd want enough oil inside there that it's splashing around and having a cooling effect. Um, and here is the test results. Here I've actually taken a small geared motor um, and, uh, and I've done tests where I've added, you can see in this graph here from zero, four, eight, 12. I'm going up in increments of 12 milliliters of oil. Um, and you can see that for the first little bits of oil, there's very little improvement in the conductivity. Um, so right up here, I'm at 16 milliliters of oil, and I've only improved it, you know, maybe 10 to 15 percent over no oil at all inside the motor. But then we see a very sudden jump in effectiveness as I go from 16 to 20 milliliters, and then to 26, 32, all the way up to 50 up here. Um, and the net effect is that, especially at lower speeds, you can see it almost doubles the conductivity. Um, so oil cooling is a really uh, classic way of, of helping, helping move, move the heat out from a, a machine or a mechanical system. But it has, a significant, it has two significant downsides in this e-bike application. Uh, one of them is that the motors that are on the market right now are not designed to be sealed against oil. Usually they have pretty good shaft seals on them. They often bond the side plates and the screws with some kind of sealant. Um, but almost everyone who's experimented with putting oil inside a motor has found that it eventually starts to seep out. And it can seep out and drip, get on the brake pads or the brake rotor and greatly reduce <laughs> the mechanical braking capability of the bike. Um, and uh, sometimes it can just leave a little puddle in your living room if you bring the bike in the living room. Um, and so it takes a bit of extra effort if you're gonna experiment with oil sealing to go above and beyond in order to make sure every possible crack is uh, properly uh, sealed with something that isn't going to give way um, with the effects of oil, which kind of has a way of <laughs> working its way through lots of little cracks. Um, but the benefit of this is that it, it's a, an approach that could work both with geared and direct drive motors. Um, and this here is a test that we did with a geared motor, um, and, uh, and it's um, viable that way. Um, it has a downside and a second downside, I forgot to mention this, um, that all of the oil inside the wheel has viscosity and the viscosity causes more drag to spin the hub. Um, and so the drag of an oil field filled motor can be fairly substantial. Um, and especially if you had a motor that was freewheeling like a geared motor, now you suddenly go to a lot of, of fluids splashing around. So the difference in drag is quite a bit, um, quite a bit as a percentage level there. Um, so one of the things that uh, in our course of experimenting with oil coolants and, uh, and different cooling strategies, um, we had a brainwave at one point looking at some uh, articles discussing using ferrofluid uh, to increase the, uh, the um, air gap flux inside motors um, and uh, realized that ignoring any flux benefit effects, that having a, a ferrofluid, which is an oil that's uh, magnetic um, might let us have the benefits of oil cooling without the leakage considerations because uh, there would be an expectation that this um, uh, electromagnetic ferrofluid oil would stay stuck to the magnets. It wouldn't float around the motor and get into the wire and get into the axle, get out of the bearings. Um, and our um, assumptions there proved to be completely correct. Um, so with ferrofluid, it's possible to have almost all the same thermal conductivity benefits as oil, 
um, but without the leakage and sealing concerns. You do need to seal around the side cover of the motor, but you don't have to worry about it getting through the bearings, getting through the axle, getting through the wires. Um, and it also can do this without causing much noticeable drag. So it's you know maybe 5% extra rotational drag in a direct drive motor to add the ferrofluid, whereas an oil fill would increase that drag by more like 50%. Um, and uh, so this graph here, you can see a, a very typical motor plot. Um, this is the thermal conductivity of the motor as it is, as a stock motor. So this is a prototype motor from ASI. Um, and then when we added uh, 10 milliliters of ferrofluid, that thermal conductivity increased quite dramatically, just about doubling at all the RPM ranges that we tested it at. Um, so those are the three most common uh, uh, cooling techniques that have sort of made their way into um, not really commercial practice yet. We hope to see some of that, but certainly for people doing custom vehicles, um, there's some pretty low hanging fruit uh, options to, to greatly improve the, the workable power span of a motor just by adding additional cooling benefits. Um, a lot of people in the DIY scene are experimenting even with active cooling. So they'll have powered fans that force air through the motor, um, or they'll have, you know, some in cases water cooling systems where you run pipes of, of, of water and then have a heat exchanger somewhere on the bike. Um, those are all very functional, they'll work excellent, but of course you're adding a ton of complexity. Uh, the benefit about the three things here is that they're all entirely passive. They don't require any more active systems on the bike. Um, so that all gets us to the motor power capabilities. And this is the, the crux of the decision making and, and so much confusion when it comes to choosing hub motors is that we all want to talk about a motor as being rated for a given power. Like, oh, you have a big heavy bike, you need a 2000 watt motor. You need you know, 500 watts to go up this hill. And all of that is very true, um, but the uh, richer understanding of how much power a motor can produce comes about from appreciating the thermal limitations of the motor, the mechanical limitations of the motor, as well as the system that you're pairing it with, the voltage of the battery, the motor controller, um, as well as the time duration that you're willing to accept that you're wanting to run it at a given power level. Um, so with all of the information here, what I'm going to show you a little bit after this is how we can use our simulator tool to actually figure out the true power limit that any motor will produce under any situation. Um, and I've shown you this right here. Um, so in all of the characteristics of a motor, there's no spec for wattage. There's specs for the KV, there's specs for the resistance, there's specs for the heat conductivity. The combination of all of those terms and how they interact with each other is what determines the effective power that you can sustain for long durations and for short durations for a given motor. And there's no way to, to express that with a given number or even to use back of the envelope calculations very easily. It really is best done with the full model and simulation. Um, so it's true that manufacturers will often give a rating for the motors that they sell, and that can be a really useful guideline, especially when manufacturers are internally consistent. They say a 250 watt, 350, and a 500 watt motor, you could expect the 500 watt has you know, roughly double the power capabilities as the 250, but it doesn't mean that it can only produce 500 watts, or it doesn't even mean that it can produce 500 watts continuously without overheating, um, because the actual power you can do continuously is very, very dependent on the RPM that the motor is spinning at. Um, so what I've done here is I've, I've made a graph for uh, the, the motor that we manufacture, our all-axle hub motor, um, or I should say a chart, where I've used our simulator tool in order to figure out what is the actual power capability of the motor at different RPMs. Because um, the slower a motor spins, the less power it's generating for a given torque and for a given amount of heat output, um, as well as the less effective heat cooling it has because there's less airflow flowing through. So with this direct drive motor, the all axle hub, if you were to say a limit, let's say it can't get more than 110 degrees Celsius, and you were to run the motor at 100 RPM, that's you know equivalent to, uh, what would that be, about like 14, 13 kilometers an hour. Um, so that's maybe the speed that you might be going up a steeper hill. This motor can only do 250 watts of power while staying under 110 degree temperature. Now that's if you're climbing continuously forever. So that's the, the temperature climbs, climbs, and it slowly levels off and it'll level off at 110 degrees, producing 250 watts. Now most hills you run into don't last nearly that long. So if you allow yourself to climb a hill that's over in five minutes, um, you can actually run the motor at 500 watts. So you can run at double this continuous power um, 
for a five minute duration and still stay under that 110 degree temperature seal. Um, and what you notice if you look at this, as you increase the RPM, the power capability of your motor increases almost linearly. It actually increases more than linearly. So when I, you know, uh, double from 100 to 200 RPM, my continuous power more than doubles from 250 to 560. And that's because that higher speed travel has better heat cooling capabilities. Um, and so you ask yourself, is this motor a, a 250 watt motor or is it a 500 watt motor or is it a 750 watt motor? Well, that is yes to all of those at 400 RPM, which is moving really fast. That's about a 50 kilometer an hour bike speed. I can run continuously at 1250 watts without overheating the motor. This is the same motor that would overheat at 250 watts when I'm doing a much slower hill climb. Um, and uh, what you can see from this table is that the addition of the ferrofluid coolant inside the motor increases by about 50% what the continuous power capability is of the motor, but it increases the short duration power by a much lower amount. Because in the short duration, we're limited more by the ability of the motor to absorb the heat rather than the motor's ability to shed it to the air outside. So, you know, you can see here that at the five minute limit, the state array only increased the, the power I can run at five minutes from 500 to 575 watts. Um, whereas it increased the continuous limit from 250 to 340. So that's about a 50% increase. This is like a, you know, 15% increase. Um, and this 50% increase in power um, is because a 50% increase in power at the same speed is 50% more torque. 50% more torque means, again, that's uh, like over 100% more heat because of the I squared R relationship. Um, and 100% more heat, the stator aid can double the ability to shed the heat. So we can have double heat being generated and still keep ourselves within that temperature limit. Um, so um, let me see. Oh, oh, it's right here. Uh, so I'm going to just try this for a second, see if that works. Great. Um, so here I have, and I'm just going to show you how I made this graph because it's something that some of you would maybe enjoy doing and, and creating similar kind of plots for other models of motor. Um, so in our motor simulator, if you check this auto throttle button, it'll automatically adjust the effective uh, power to the motor to, um, to the target speed where I click on the graph. So let's say we want to know what is the power capability of this crystallite motor at 25 kilometers an hour. So I click on 25 kilometers an hour, um, and now my graph is always, uh, my throttle adjusts itself to the 25 kil kilometer an hour point. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna vary the grade, right? So if I increase the grade that my vehicle's climbing, I'm now running more and more power through that motor. And as I do that, I can look at these numbers here. So at a you know 6% grade, I was at 79 degrees Celsius. As I keep climbing steeper, um, now I am at uh, 123 degrees. And so if you say 123 degrees is the maximum I'm allowing, well, now we can say this motor is a 680 watt motor at 25 kilometers an hour. If you want instead to say, okay, how hard can I push it to within a five minute working envelope, I could then continue to increase this grade um, until I see an overheat time of five minutes. So here I'm 13 minutes seven minutes, four minutes, so that was a little bit too much. Let's drop that down, 4.7, uh, somewhere around 17.1. Um, anyways, you get the idea. So that's a little under five minutes. So at the five minute mark, um, you can see that this motor is producing 1200 watts. So you could call this a 1200 watt motor um, and it will happily do 500 watts if you keep that within a five minute window. Now, what does five minute mean in terms of hill climbs? Well, if you're moving 25 kilometers an hour for five minutes, um, five minutes is one twelfth of an hour. So you're gonna be covering um, roughly uh, uh, two kilometers of range. Now, a two kilometer hill that's 17.5% grade steep is pretty much unheard of. So hills of this level of steepness are almost always, you know, short driveways, or it's just like the final hurdle at the end of some uh, some climb, and it's usually only going to last a couple hundred meters. So in practice, it's no problem to run this setup um, up a, you know, 
and, and push it up a 17% grade hill because that hill is gonna be over way before the five minutes is up and the motor itself overheats. Um, so if you wanted to, to, you know, here I was doing that manually. One of the features that we added to the simulator last year that we haven't really uh, publicly discussed too much is this ability to run a simulation set. So what I was doing there is I was varying the grade in order to get more and more power when I chose the auto throttle so that I was running it, I was looking at the numbers at a fixed speed. If I run a simulation set, I can vary any of these model parameters um, and then I can have, the, have it do that automatically and then save the results into a little uh, data file. So here we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to vary the percent grade from 0 to 20%. And maybe we'll do this in, you know, let's do it in 50 simulations. Okay? Um, so I can hit, and here we choose what, what data do we want to save. So we, we, we want to do is we want to save all the information that's at this 25 kilometer an hour point. So I could hit go here. And now you see it's automatically increasing the grade. You can see the simulator itself is stepping through uh, higher and higher powers. You can see the motor power increasing, the overheat in time. And then on the output of this, we have a set of data, um, which is the numbers that we had down here um, at uh, every single one of those simulations. So now we could take all this data, uh, copy it, and then, oops, <laughs> I, I think there's a button to copy the clipboard. Um, and then we could paste that into a spreadsheet and then run a nice analysis. Or if you're a programmer, you could run a Python script or another script in order to make really nice plots that plot these pieces of information. Um, if you want it to be even more comprehensive, instead of saving just the data from that one uh, speed that we set here, uh, we could run a simulation set and we could save all data. So if we do this, it's going to do that same thing, but now we're saving every single piece of information in this data plot curve. Um, and this is a useful thing. Let me, uh, typically you wouldn't uh, do this varying the grade. This might be something uh, where it'd be very useful and interesting um, if you wanted to, uh, for instance, vary the voltage. Um, so if you want to see, you know, have a plot where you map out the performance of a motor on one axis and the voltage on another axis, I could run a simulation set where I choose the, uh, ah. oh shoot, uh, I thought that I had that battery voltage here. Um, okay, I, oh bummer. Um, I might add that to the simulation in the, in the future. Um, but yeah, so you, you could vary, you know, human power. You, another thing to vary is the motor winding, the RPM per volts, um, and, uh, um, but yeah, so now here I'm doing a simulation where I'm um, changing the uh, KV of the motor. So this is simulating faster and faster motor windings and giving me all the different plots along the way. And then those results are saved. I can download them to a file. Um, and then that file, I could open it up in a spreadsheet and then see um, all those numbers and then try to generate more useful three-dimensional graphs or stuff showing motor performance, not as a static value, but as a function of vehicle speed loadings, maximum temperatures, etc. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that is uh, what I hope to provide a, um, a sort of a deeper insight into the characteristics of a motor. Um, so there's a whole bunch of topics that I really wanted to dive into further. And as I was preparing this slideshow, I'm being a little bit realistic about the amount of time it was going to take. Um, uh, I wasn't able to get to a whole bunch of additional topics, which I'm going to mention here. So uh, one of the core ones was specifically how to choose a motor for a given application. So if you know the, the weight of a vehicle, if you know the kind of aerodynamic drag profile, uh, if you know the kind of hills that you're encountering, um, the simulator tools on our website uh, that I just showed you there make it very straightforward to see if any motor is up to the task or not up to the task. Um, and we'll also let you see how doing things like changing from a 26-inch wheel to a 20-inch wheel might be the difference to make it over the line of working or not working. Um, uh, another topic I really wanted to get into was uh, choosing the right motor winding speed. So the motors, uh, and I, I went over here, but the, the most fundamental motor characteristic is the, um, where did I go on that? Um, basic motor theory, this RPM per volt, the, the winding constant. Um, 
for most of the motors that are available, you can get the same motor in faster and slower wines. And a lot of people are really confused about whether they should get a fast wine or, or a slow wine motor for their application. What are the differences of the ramifications? Um, and, uh, and one of the important things to understand on that is that uh, fast wine motors and slow wine motors have exactly the same performance capabilities. If you have a motor controller and a battery voltage that are scaled in proportion to the fast and the slow winding, the motors behave just the same way. Um, so that it becomes more of a trade-off of just deciding how fast you want to go for the voltage battery you happen to have. Um, I really wanted to go into uh, quite some detail explaining how to use our motor simulator. I showed this, this um, um, uh, a simulation set tool, but the more basic usage of the simulator I didn't go into, and I was sort of assuming that a lot of the people watching this have, have played around with it. Um, the question of when do you choose between a geared hub or a direct drive motor for a given application is a really interesting one. Um, and this, this is a topic that is of, of some relevance to, to the audience for the Spezzy Bike Show. Um, and uh, and this one that there's personal preference comes into it quite a bit, but there are some cases that really do. Uh, where one of these options really stands out more appropriately than the other. Um, and, uh, and in a quick nutshell, when you're either trying to go fast or if you just need something that is just bomb-proof and robust and you're not too concerned about weight, uh, the direct drive motor always makes the most sense. Um, and when you really want something that is minimalistic, uh, uh, <laughs> minimal size and lightweight, um, and you're uh, not doing a cross-continent trip or traveling through extreme circumstances, uh, the geared motors these days are amazing in their specs and capabilities. Um, and I'm increasingly being drawn into the geared motor camp, just given how reliable they've managed to make them in spite of all the internal complexity. Um, I really wanted to talk about uh, dual hub motor systems. Uh, there's a lot of applications, especially with heavy vehicles, but you just can't do it with one hub motor. Uh, but the benefit of hubs is it's really easy to add dual front motors or even trip <laughs> three motors, we've even seen some do quad motors, and then you can take these vehicles. So sometimes it's like a party vehicle where five or six people are riding and pedaling the same thing. Um, in other cases, it's for really practical cargo hauling applications. So a lot of postal um, delivery services, courier companies are now doing cargo bikes where they'll have 400 to 800 pounds of gear in the back of a tricycle or in a trailer. Um, and that's just beyond what one motor can do, but two motors can make a world of difference. Um, and, uh, and I'd love to go into a, a deeper explanation of regenerative braking. Um, so these are all topics that I, I realize could just warrant their own seminars uh, on future weeks. Um, and so this was a little bit of a, a trial run to see how well this platform worked for you guys. So I'm really interested to hear um, uh, feedback from people who've been watching this, if it was a uh, meaningful thing to engage with. Um, and then there's a lot of comments uh, coming here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to scroll through some of the comments and post them and just address uh, some of the, the questions or things people want to have talk about. Um, but what I'd like to do is schedule, you know, especially while we're in our, our global lockdown and tons of people are at home with computers without the freedom to ride bikes as much as they'd want to. Um, I think it'd be really fun to be doing weekly or bi-weekly seminars of this nature that go into quite deep technical dives on these topics. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, so there's, uh, I'm just going to highlight, I think, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to just go scroll through some of the comments here and just address them a little bit free form. I haven't been watching the comments that I've been talking, so I've been too busy talking, um, but I'm, uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, uh, point out ones that, that strike my fancy. Um, so this question, why do off-the-shelf e-bike manufacturers choose to develop mid-drives over hub motors? Um, and there's a lot of opinions on this matter, but I think a, a really strong one that I feel to be the case is the proprietary shift that that grants them. So when e-bike manufacturers use a uh, mid-drive system and a fully integrated mid-drive system, they really have a whole component set that's tied into their supply line. Um, there's much less, uh, there's sort of a, a lot more lock-in from the customer to get uh, replacement components from that bike. Um, and they're less versatile for swapping and retrofitting and hacking into. Uh, for a typical company, that's a benefit. Um, and there's been a lot of very aggressive marketing on mid-drives, and some of it quite valid. And there's no doubt that mid-drive systems are um, uh, quite advantageous when you're doing off-road biking. We need a really nimble bike where you can pick up the front of the rear wheel when you're handling interesting terrain. Um, but, uh, but they've sort of done that to the exclusion of... A, pushing hub motor development 
and we're we're strongly believing that hub motors have sort of been left out of some of the uh, um, higher caliber engineering that's gone into the e-bike scene. Um, and um, we would love to see a little bit of this pendulum swing back into hub motors. And at the recent trade shows, we actually started seeing this as a bit of like, clearly companies are just a little nauseous of all the Bosch mid drives and sort of the aesthetic of having these mid motors. And as a bike manufacturer, the mid motors end up sort of owning the product rather than the bike company. And with the hub motor, we put it in the hands of the bike and the frame manufacturer um, to have more control over what they do because they can pick and choose from a wider source of hub motors for their product. Um, here is a question from uh, liquid cooling Mac and GMAC motors. Um, so in the test on the, the geared motor where I showed up oil cooling in the G310 motor, um, that was what I was hoping to be the start of a very in-depth investigation on oil cooling and different cooling uh, fluids to use in geared motors. Uh, the stator aid is kind of like a miracle cure for direct drive motors, but it really doesn't work at all in a geared hub. Uh, the motor inside is spinning at much too fast of an RPM and the centrifugal forces are much stronger than the magnetic forces. So it loses its ability to stay bridging the gap between the magnets and the core. Um, uh, so we have uh, um, some of our uh, customers and fans have been um, uh, experimenting with liquid cooling on their own and sharing results from us. Um, one person has been doing something very, very interesting, uh, which is instead of using conventional ATF oils or, or synthetic fluids, um, he's actually been using water-based coolants, um, which seems crazy to fill a motor with water, seal it in, especially given all the examples people have seen of totally rusted out hub motors. Um, uh, but with uh, appropriate distillation of the water and the use of anti-corrosion inhibitors inside there, um, he's been able to get months of months of use uh, with a water-cooled Mac motor. Um, and so I'm sort of fascinated to hear what other fluids might be viable here and that might be a little bit less prone to this sort of oily leakage problem that exists when people use automatic transmission fluid. Um, unfortunately, we have not resumed our own uh, experiments with um, fluid cooling of geared motors. Um, our wind tunnel is currently out of commission as part of the drivetrain for the fan broke, and I've had these plans of rebuilding it with an inline motor, and I just haven't got around to that. Um, so yeah, so that's related. This data rate coming to the GMAC. Uh, so if we do the GMAC motor and, and the newer Mac motors, as well as a lot of the motors from Bafang are actually sealed enough that they can handle fluid fills without much additional modification. They've got O-rings on the side cover of the motor um, and they have O-ring seals on all of the screw heads as well as shaft seals around the shaft. Um, and so, uh, it wouldn't be Staterade, but it would be other coolant fluids that we would make available, and we would probably then add an injection port to add the fluid without having to take the side cover off the motor. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to hear that people have learned stuff from this talk. Um, uh, all of these talks will be available, uh, obviously, for perpetuity afterwards. So I tend, uh, yeah, so if any of this stuff didn't digest or sink in and you want to revisit it, then once it's done, you can go back and look over areas that you uh, seemed a little bit confusing uh, or needed a revisiting. Um, but I am uh, glad to hear that people are interested in additional topics, and I think we're going to make this into uh, something of a weekly uh, event. Um, that's his question. Are motors and controllers in one wheels different than e-bikes? Not at all. Um, so one wheels are uh, self-balancing unicycles. Um, and uh, <laughs> to show how not different they are, um, let me just hide my, uh, stop my slide here. Uh, um, sorry about this, That's not, there we go. Uh, so if I look in my Dropbox, uh, um, um, <laughs> uh, so this was my first attempt at building a one wheel. Um, this was, I think, in 20, 2009. Um, and it is, of course, an e-bike hub motor with an e-bike motor controller. Um, and if you take apart these, these self-balancing things, the, the internal construction motor, they are from the same supply line as the e-bike hub motors. The difference, of course, is that the motor controller needs to have a control scheme that maintains balancing. So there's a gyro and an accelerometer on board. Instead of the you know, throttle being controlled by the user, a torque sensor, it's got its own little feedback loop. Um, but it's possible to DIY your own one wheel with e-bike hardware for sure if you are able to do the inertial control system. Um, and 
Uh, so, um, what's this question here? Uh, given the power for the RPM tree you showed, where motor can put out linearly more power with RPM, isn't that the single strongest argument for using mid drives? Uh, great question, Nikolai. <laughs> um, so the uh, uh, let me uh, go back to the, I'm going to go to the live version of our simulator here. Um, so it's true in, the, in this graph that I showed you here. Um, so I, I showed you straight from the uh, product info um, and our all axle motor, motor power. Um, in this graph here, uh, you can see that the, uh, this chart, there's sort of a linear increase in power with RPM. The reason for that is that in direct drive motors, which this is, almost all of the power of the heat generation is being generated from core losses. Uh, I'm sorry, from copper losses. So the amount of core loss, the amount of heat caused from the eddy currents in the, in the steel and from the hysteresis, you're talking like 30 to 40 watts, whereas when we're you know, at the thermal limits of the motor, we're often having many hundreds of watts of copper being uh, expending the heat. Um, and so as we increase the RPM of the motor, those core losses aren't increasing very much. Um, and it's the, the copper loss dominates this curve. The situation is totally different when you're talking about a geared motor. Um, and so inside a geared motor, so mid drives are geared motors. In a geared motor, if I was to do the same um, uh, inside here, um, uh, where would be the best way to show this? Um, uh, um, so in, a, in, a, in this direct drive motor, we sort of had like 30 watts of heat um, uh, from the core. And then, but we were seeing that the copper losses, you know, could get up to a thousand watts or whatever. Um, when you're dealing with a geared motor, the amount of, co of, of core losses is a lot higher. And as you increase, and the geared motors are also smaller in size. So they're more sensitive to the amount of heat that they can put out. Um, and so as a geared motor gets spun faster to a higher RPM, you actually get to a point where not only is the power limit not increasing, it actually starts to decrease again. And the geared motors are already very well optimized for the RPM that they run at. And this is true whether it's a mid motor or a, a direct drive motor. Um, and you don't have the ability to continuously increase the power by going to higher and higher RPMs. They're pretty much maxed out at their power point. Um, and I can show you that if we take, for instance, the, uh, let's use the small Bafang motor. Um, this is the, uh, sure, let's use the G3, G310 motor, uh, simulate this. Um, so here, if I look at the, um, and I'll go here to say kilometers per hour, um, at, uh, um, so where, where am I, what's sort of my power capability here at, you know, I can only go, uh, before I overheat, I'm sort of motor power 450 watts at 30 kilometers an hour. So if this was a direct drive motor, you might think, okay, so this, this motor is 450 watts at 30 kilometers an hour at 60 kilometers an hour. I must be able to do. 900 watts. This little geared motor could do 900 watts if it's doing the same torque but double the speed. But here's what happens if we do that. If I run a 72 volt battery instead of a 36 volt battery, so I'm going much, much faster here. Um, at this higher speed, if I look at my uh, final heat temperature, you can see here I actually overheat at 570 watts. So even though I'm going twice as fast, I'm only getting 100 watts more power, so only 20% more power. And the ability to get more and more power at higher speeds is totally taken away when the motor's already spinning at a high speed. Um, and uh, um, so, so yeah, so a, 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 a mid-drive motor has a benefit when the vehicle speed is changing frequently. So if you're often going slowly or going fast, you can have a motor running in a more sort of optimal range, but on a vehicle, you often just want to move more or less at the same speed all the time. So if you're planning to ride a bike that goes uphill at 30 kilometers an hour and goes downhill on 40, um, there's no benefit to going through a kind of mid-motor setup. And a hub motor that can do the hill climb can also do the flats and can run quite efficiently. Um, uh, let's see what else here. Um, uh, Okay. 
Um, love to hear about multiple motors and how they can handle the need for differentials on dual wheels. So this is a topic that I'm looking for us to get into because we've done a lot of stuff with dual motor vehicles. Uh, that's bikes with front and rear motors, that's tricycles with two side-by-side -side motors, um, uh, that's some tricycles with three motors on them. And one of the things that comes up all the time is do you need a differential? You have, when you're doing a corner, your inside motor is slow, spinning more slowly than the outside motor. And so many people assume <laughs> erroneously, but for some valid, uh, valid foundations that they somehow need to electronically differentiate the two motors, so that the outer motor is being driven with a higher throttle voltage in order to account for the fact that it's spinning faster. Um, and that is not at all the case and not required. Um, if you have a, the way that the e-bike motors uh, run, if the motor happens to spin a little bit faster, a little bit slower, you might have one wheel generating more torque than the other wheel, um, but they both run perfectly smoothly. They might not share the load 50-50, um, but there's no benefit or advantage to really adding the complexity of doing any kind of differential. So if you have a mechanical system driving two motors, you absolutely need a differential because otherwise one of the motors will skid on the ground. Um, but in an electric motor, it's no problem to speed up or slow down a motor when you're feeding it the same throttle signal. Um, and, uh, and so in general, differentials don't need to be part of the picture at all. You can just have the straight simplicity of just running all the motors with the same power. Um, Okay, uh, it's just question. Uh, using a hub motor as an alternator to charge the battery, how hard do we have to pedal to generate some serious amps? Uh, the answer is hard. Um, and this is something that our simulator will also show you. So if you want, say you have a motor and you want to see how it's going to behave as a motor generator, uh, say you just have a basic generic motor like this, um, you're around a 36 volt battery pack, um, and you want to get an idea of how it behaves as a generator, um, you can very easily uh, you can see that the simulator graph goes into negative territory here. It doesn't show the plot very far, but if you scroll the graph over here, you see that the numbers keep on growing. Um, so even though you're not seeing it on the graph, you can see how this system is going to behave as a generator. So if you wanted to generate, um, uh, you know, say, uh, so here, so th this is interesting. So one thing, when you're, when you're dealing with systems where it's a motor, you notice that the motor power excuse me, um, is always less than the battery power. Um, so here, the battery is you're drawing 150 watts out of the battery, and the motor is only generating 124 watts. Once we're into the regen territory, we now see that the motor power is more negative than the battery power. And that's because the efficiency is working the other way. So if you wanted to put, so when you say it's serious amps into the battery, let's say we want to pedal and put five amps into our 36 volt battery pack. So I could drag this over until I see five amps here. Um, so 4.8 amps, close enough. So 4.8 amps, I don't know if that's, that's <laughs> serious amps, but for charging a battery, it's a reasonable amperage. Um, so that's gonna be putting 186 watts into this battery pack, but it means that the motor is generating 217 watts of drag, or in other words, you need to put in 217 watts of human power into the motor in order to do that. Uh, 217 watts is, um, it's a, I mean, it's an amount that most you could probably do that for 10 minutes and build up a good sweat. Um, but if you wanted to charge your battery from flat to, to fully charged, where you need to put in 217 watts for maybe three hours, um, I think you would be uh, uh, wishing for, <laughs> for a break uh, early on in that, uh, that endeavor. Um, and uh, but yeah, but it is, it is, we do get asked quite often, like, hey, I'm planning to use a hub motor as a generator. And it's good to point out that you can actually simulate the generating efficiency um, and the RPM you need to spin the motor. So if you're running it as kind of a dumb generator where you just spin the motor back or, back or than the back, <laughs> faster than the back EMF constant, um, say you wanted to, to flip this over, you wanted to know how many RPM do I need to spin the motor at in order to charge a 36 volt battery with this motor? Well, you can see that I have to spin the motor you know, 360 RPM is gonna get me four amps of current. If I increase that to 375 RPM, I'll get 10 amps of current. Say that you can't pedal, no one can pedal 375 RPM. Um, you know, you would have a gear between a pedal and the motor. Um, but if your gearing only lets you go up to 240 RPM, well, you're not gonna be able to charge this without a regen capable motor controller, but you could explore a slower motor winding. So for instance, if I look through my um, it's the slowest motor wine that we have. Go through the history of slow motors here. 
you could try a Chris Light 411 motor. And this motor, you see, it starts charging a battery as low as 212 RPM. So this is a motor with a higher kV, a higher, um, sorry, a lower kV, lower RPM per volt. Um, and as a result, we can spin at a lower RPM to generate enough voltage to charge the 36 volt battery pack. Um, and you can see to charge it at five amps, I'd only have to spin the motor at 235 RPM. Um, so yeah, so you can use this as uh, uh, measurements in regen systems too. And that's something that uh, not everyone is aware of. Okay, um, so what's this question? Um, you've said the main benefit of regenerative braking is that you wear out your brake less. Could someone with a generic e-bike kit with a non-regen controller build a resistor dump to do this easily? Um, <laughs> I suppose you could build a resistor dump easily, but switching on the resistor dump is not easy. Um, and the reason for that is that the um, Hub motors are three-phase motors, and so your resistor uh, would have to be a three-phase resistor, and it means you'd have to have a three-phase switch to switch the hub motor to connect to that three-phase resistor or not. Um, one of the downsides with um, with uh, a resistor, if you, if you use a resistor in order to slow the bike down, is that the braking force is gonna decrease as you slow down as well. So when you connect a resistor at a high speed, you get quite a high braking force, and then that braking force will become less and less and less as you come to a stop. And that's not usually the stopping behavior that most people want. Most people actually want kind of the opposite, a more gentle engagement of the brake, and then as they slow down, they increase the braking intensity. Um, so if you have a generic e-bike kit, um, with a regen capable motor. So that just means you have a motor, like a direct drive motor. Um, uh, I would recommend getting a regen motor controller. It's not the most expensive purchase and it just opens up a whole new realm of usage. And, uh, and for people that are, you know, energy geeks, there's a, a ton of fun about seeing your kinetic energy that you've, you know, built up, getting up to speed or going downhill, suddenly going back into the battery pack. Um, and seeing yourself almost never touch the actual mechanical brakes on the bike. Um, not to mention that, you know, five to 10% additional range that you get uh, just with stop and go traffic conditions. So if you have a well behaving regen motor controller, the actual amount that you can recapture, even if you're not in a hilly environment, just from the stop and go um, can sometimes get into double digit territory. So um, yeah, uh, consider saving up for a regen controller. You will not regret it. Um, uh, making your own micro geared hubs. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're actually, I mean, if you were to look at my workbench right now, um, this is my dyno um, and on it, we're actually experimenting and, and characterizing a lot of the really tiny uh, geared hub motors that are on the market right now. This is one of the ones from AKM that's just, uh, um, it's a, a, one of the 1.2, uh, kilo motors with the double stage reduction. Um, a really cute design has different uh, left and right side spoke flanges to really minimize the uh, kind of weight. Um, I've got a um, this is the Bafang G370 motor that's also in this kind of smaller power class than the, the G310 motors. Um, so we're continuously um, examining what's already been engineered and made available on the market um, to uh, uh, to see if we find one that really ticks off all the checkbooks that we have, especially in terms of robustness. Um, we found that the G310 motors, much as we love them, have been one of our highest percentage of motor failures and RMAs that we've had to deal with. Um, we've had issues with the magnets coming loose. We've had issues with clutch failures. We've had issues with gear failures. That's obviously from us supplying them with more power than they can take. So we've since been you know, rolling back the, the phase current limits of the motor controller with any of those systems, but they're not that amenable to being used at, you know, higher speed commuting. Like I really like a small motor that can do 40 kilometers an hour. I think that suits a lot of people's uh, desires who are, who are cycle commuters. Um, and uh, so what our goal is, and it, it's funny, <laughs> funny that you, you mentioned that, um, our plan with all of these motors is to have um, a lineup of small geared motors that have built-in temperature sensors that's multiplexed with the speed sensor. Um, and so you, the motors that are actually on my, on my dyno have had this modification where we have um, inside the six conductor plug, there's the 
Um, typically, the, the six wire is used as a speed sensor. Optionally, we were using that as a temperature sensor, but it's really nice to have a built-in speed sensor. Uh, there's no reason you can't have both of those in on the one wire. Um, so our plan is to have a, a product lineup of geared motors with both speed and temperature sensing. And that way, you don't have the overheating concerns that you normally have with these small motors. Um, it's funny that all the motors we have with temperature sensors are the big, powerful ones that don't need them as much and aren't as vulnerable to overheating. It's really the small ones that need it the most. Um, and that I'm hoping by by you know, this summer we'll, we'll have temperature sensors in all of our motors. Um, as far as us making our own micro geared hub, uh, the expertise to design and fabricate gears and, uh, and clutches and all that isn't something we have much in house. We certainly know what are the weak points of the, the third party ones. Um, but we are, uh, one of the things I would like to do on these small geared motors is also have regen capable ones. So having little motors without a clutch that have the same benefits of the G-Max. So you can do regenerative braking um, and they would use the virtual electronic freewheeling capability of the base runner or phase runner controllers uh, for those who are concerned about the motor drag. Uh, so yeah, so there's things for you to look forward to on this front. Um, can ABS-like behavior be built into the firmware? Okay, that's a, uh, a fun question. So ABS is to prevent the lockup of brakes. And when you have mechanical brakes on a system and you run them at a continuous drag, there's a, a chance of the, the, the brakes kind of binding. And then if they bind a little bit, um, you can have the wheel skid. And if a wheel skids, it loses traction. Um, and the way that regenerative braking works is that it's it's... Uh, it has none of that, you know, the, the, the modulation of the regen is, is flawless. Unlike having mechanical brakes that can sometimes pulsate a little bit where you could inadvertently squeeze more than you'd want to, the regen brake is smooth, so, so smooth and controllable and it pretty much never would cause the wheel to skid. Um, so the, the braking force, it's not like a disc brake that could skin the wheel, skid the wheel where you'd need it. Um, it uh, has a lower maximum braking torque um, and we've never really heard of somebody um, asking about um, something to reduce that torque to prevent skidding. Um, but it does, it parallels with the same problem of traction control when you're having a motor acting for thrust. Um, and so, you know, there's people that have hub motors that skid out a little bit when they're um, uh, doing propulsion and a sensor that could see, oh, the motor's suddenly accelerated or it's moving at a different speed than the non-motorized wheel and scales back the power. If you had a system like that, it could just as easily apply to braking um, and to regen, uh, but in practice, the regen is not an issue even with slippery surfaces. It's a really controllable, smooth uh, uh, braking method. Um, uh, so here's a question, uh, JPOP about photography. Am I correct in saying that there's no way to simulate motor performance with field weakening? Um, I won't say there's no way. Um, so in our motor simulator, one thing that a lot of people don't really know <laughs> is that you can simulate any custom motor that you want. Um, so if you hit custom motor, you could then enter all of the parameters that um, emulate the, uh, that represent the motor. Um, one thing that you could do to get kind of an idea of the performance of a motor with field weakening is, uh, so here I've actually, you know, so the, this is the motor, this is, I mean, this is the motor that I use in my example in the, in the graph, um, but, uh, um, if, if you were, let me just give that motor a bit lower of a winding resistance. Oops. Um, so I'm going to give that maybe 0.1 ohms. Um, uh, so that's a little bit more typical. Um, so if I wanted to simulate how this motor would behave, what the efficiency would be like if I'm doing field weakening, um, so if I have it running at a higher effective uh, kV or RPM per volt, um, one way to do that uh, would be, and I'm not sure, this is obviously not going to be <laughs> fully accurate, um, but to a first order, I can simply leave the resistance as it is, but increase the RPM per volt. So if I was to, to say have enough field weakening so that I increase my speed by 20%, but I leave the resistance as it is, um, that's going to then simulate a motor that goes faster, but it's not going to be as efficient as an actually faster motor, because if you were to increase the KV by 12 in a real motor, you would reduce the resistance of the motor by that different square. So to simulate that in a, um, a uh, um, an accurate way, so if a faster motor has less running resistance, it would be uh, 10 divided by 12 squared. Um, and then I'd take that times my 0.1 ohms. 
Okay, so it'd be 0 0.069. So call it 0 0.07. Um, and now I'm going to open system B. Um, and then this one here, I'm going to put it back to the uh, 1 ohm, 0.1. Um, Um, uh, there's not something broke a little bit there. Um, what we should have seen is, anyways, uh, it might be that, yeah, that's, that's, there might be an issue with the custom motor here. Um, but you can see that at the 0 0.07, with the, a non field weakening motor that was faster, I have a peak efficiency in this example of 90%. Um, and if I was to do kind of a, a crudely simulated field weakening, um, I would have left this at its original resistance. Um, and then you would see that at that speed, my peak efficiency is lower, it's 88%. Um, this isn't accounting for the additional copper losses that they face, so really it's worse than that. Um, one of the things that I would love to do, um, and I'm planning to do on the motor simulator, is really update the underlying motor model that's being used. Right now, the, the simulator is assuming a trapezoidal motor controller, um, and it's basing itself, it's basing all the equations and the behavior, how it responds to the inductance of the windings, as though it was a trapezoidal drive. And when you have a non-trapezoidal motor controller, if you have a, a sign, or sorry, a field-oriented motor controller, um, oops, let me go back to my custom motor. Um, um, so I'm going to go, uh, yeah, so, so in this motor here, like th this here is the, the plot, you know, you can see how is the power and torque decreasing or increasing as my speed decreases. Um, if I add a bunch of inductance to this motor, um, so say I modify it so that my winding inductance is uh, a lot higher. Um, so let's go 0 0.5 millihenries. Now you see that it's the motor with the same resistance, but the slope here has much steeper fall off, or, or much like it, you have to slow down the motor more to get the same power output. Whereas before I did that, it was steeper like this. Um, this is with the trapezoidal controller, the inductance of the motor causes this slope to be more and more shallow. And if you want a field oriented controller, the slope is always the same steepness regardless of the inductance. Um, and so right now the simulator is underperforming. When I choose, if I was to choose for my motor controller, um, you know, the base runner motor controller, um, it's simulating it as though the base runner was a trapezoidal controller. But really it's a field oriented controller. And what you'd see is this line here would be steep like that. And the difference is just a difference of how much inductance the, the motor has for the pole curve count in the ERPM. Um, but right now, there are aspects to the simulator that are out of date with, res with regards to the, the components that are on most of the e-bikes that we're selling. That's a little unfortunate. Um, um, a 48 volt, 250 watt hub motor in which batteries should use. Um, so this is one of those cases where 250 watt hub motor doesn't really mean very much. Um, and the battery recommendation would really depend on the amperage draw of the motor controller um, and what range you want to get out of the system. Um, so uh, there's a, a huge shortage of information to answer questions like that, but a lot of people sort of assume that, you know, controllers have a required battery or systems have a required battery, that you have full control over what battery um, option you want. The, the fact that you have a 250 watt hub motor doesn't dictate any type of battery. It would dictate the battery is the KV of the motor and how fast you want to go and how much range you want to have. Um, and, uh, and without that information, we can't guide you into to choosing an answer. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just seeing if there's any other uh, questions here that would be topical for the, the thing I was, the main point of this. Um, uh, so this is a question uh, that is kind of a bit relevant. Uh, we're running the phase runner GMAC all the way up to 96 phase amps noticeably to redu reduce the lifespan of the gears. Our experience with gears uh, and geared motors is that they don't really have a lifespan. Uh, either they fail or they don't fail. Um, and they, there's not like a wear point that we see on gears. We don't see them, you know, fatiguing or de developing micro cracks. Um, and this is uh, experienced, yeah, I guess, of the, 
longest standing geared motor that we've been in business selling are the easy geared motors. And we have a number of customers who bought easy motor kits 10 years ago in 2008, 2009, that haven't had any issues with their gears. Um, they ride their bike all the time, uh, tens of thousands of kilometers on them now. And we've had others where failures have just happened randomly within a few months of usage. Um, and so we're, yeah, we're of the opinion that the nylon using these nylon gears doesn't gradually weaken, at least not in a way that, that's been apparent to us, where after a certain amount of time, then we start seeing failures. If you were to look at the statistical distribution of gear failures, it doesn't have any correlation with how long the customer has been riding the bike for. Um, it really correlates mostly with what was the maximum power input and and, uh, and were they ever using it in ways where the motor got really hot, which then can in turn soften the gears and make them weaker. Um, but I wanted to show um, in, I think, yeah, no. I think no. Um, I, 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 I'm not. we have a video of our of our GMAC um, test station. So when we were developing the torque arm for the GMAC motor, we didn't want to just do static testing because we were using aluminum, seven thousand aluminum right as the spline interface to the, the axle. We were really concerned because aluminum does have fatigue strength limitations. Um, so we built up a test jig, um, and I think I'll find it here. Uh, towards, um, no, actually I'm in the right monitor. Oh, testing experiments. No. I don't have it. Uh, I, some might have a fun video of it, but we built a, a jig and we were going uh, up and down uh, 120 phase amps uh, uh, continuously. Uh, so it'd go positive 120 phase amps, minus 120, 120 phase amps. Um, that was on a 10 turn motor. So it was generating upwards of, I think, 130 newton meters of torque. Um, and it did that for 150,000 cycles. Um, and what ended up failing uh, was not the torque arm. Um, not the gears. The gears were totally fine when we looked at it inside. There was discoloration. It was the, we ran the motor at 150 degrees Celsius as well. Um, but it ended up being the stator from the, the constant back and forth switching of the torque. Uh, the stator ended up getting a little bit loose where it attached to the axle. Um, and that got looser and looser to the point that it then started to, um, to physically contact and scrape against the rotor. Um, and uh, um, so the, the weak point, yeah. Anyways, it's just to say that we've done very high continuous usage of these things at these high phase amps, um, and we didn't notice a lifetime degradation. Um, so this question, is it correct that having a lower KV motor is beneficial for health climbing compared to a higher KV motor the same size of weight due to staying in the more efficient region? Absolutely not. Uh, so this is one of the, the most common pieces of, of kind of misinformation about motor KVs. Um, the efficiency of a motor, whether it's a low or a high KV, is exactly the same um, if you're running at the same RPM and the same torque output, which would mean climbing the same hill. Um, where the uh, so if you're running the motor, if you're going faster up the hill, then you might be less efficient because you're going faster. But for an apples to apples comparison, a low and a high KV motor can climb hills with exactly the same uh, capabilities but the higher KV motor needs more phase amps to do that. Um, and, uh, but the, the efficiency when they're running, um, even at the higher phase amps, the efficiency will be just the same. And this is really easy to demonstrate with the motor simulator. Um, I, I, and I, I also did it with our dyno graph too, so I can show actual physical tests where we compare fast and slow wind motors um, and show them having exactly overlapping characteristics. Um, so if I was to take a 10 turn Mac motor, um, and uh, and then run uh, auto throttle. So we're going to climb up a nice ten percent grade hill, um, and uh, um, and then I'm going to run. It's a little bit easier to understand what's going on if I just run with a, um, a non uh, non torque based motor controller. Um, so here we're climbing a 10, 10 and a half percent grade hill. And, uh, and then you can pick and choose what speed you want to climb at uh, by checkboxing the auto throttle here. Um, and let me switch this over to be kilometers per hour. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, so simulation A, I've got uh, um, 
a 10 pin motor and then we're gonna open system B um, and uh, make that a GMAC um, eight turn motor. Um, so I'll use the same motor controller um, and then go also to 10.5%. Okay, um, and so now I'm gonna make my system B um, at the same speed as system A. Okay, and look at that. The eight turn and the 10 turn motors have pretty much identical looking curves. Um, they're running at uh, gonna be more or less identical efficiencies. They're gonna have the same final temperatures, the same thermal behaviors. Um, so you're not gonna see the, um, uh, any real difference. Where you do see a difference, of course, is if you're going faster, um, then the slow speed motor will let you get. So if you were to go at full throttle, you'll see that the slower motor is gonna climb at 25 kilometers an hour, the faster motor is gonna climb faster at 28. Um, I'm just gonna hide the question because it, uh, it's blocking the, um, the data here. Um, and so now in this case, you can see that the system B going faster is getting hotter. It's gonna overheat in a quicker time. It's running at a low, slightly lower efficiency. Um, but that's not, you know, that's because you're running the motor at more, <laughs> at, more, at more torque and more power going faster. If you were to take the 10 turn motor and increase the voltage, so now instead of 36 volt, let's run this guy at 48 volts. And now I slow down, I make the 10 turn motor the same as the eight turn motor once again. Um, now we see at this point on the graph, um, you'll see that the, the torque curve and the power curves of the motor um, totally intersect and we're back to having very similar performance. Um, where we don't have exactly the same performance, so you notice that system A shows 83%, 81%, and system B is 79, so there's a, a 1% efficiency difference, so we are slightly more efficient with the 10 turn motor. The reason for that is not really because the 10 turn motor is more efficient at climbing hills, it's because this efficiency takes into account the losses of the motor controller. And the 10 turn motor has less amperage flowing through the motor controller. So it's 36 amps versus 45 amps. Um, so with less amps flowing through the motor controller, the motor controller is generating less heat and the motor controller is uh, less of a, a source of losses. So if I was to take my eight turn motor and then run it with a more efficient motor controller, so I'm still gonna be 35 amps, um, but I'm going to run a very, very low winding resistance, a very low resistance, now look at that, these, uh, um, these systems, uh, it actually way overshot it, <laughs> it went up to 84%, um, which highlights how much of an effect the motor controller is contributing to the uh, potential inefficiency here. So there'd be some value where if I had chose exactly the right uh, resistance, these two um, systems would show the same net efficiency. Um, oops. Yeah, so now you see it. So if I ran it, so I think the 35 and I have models is 30 milliohms. If I ran it with a 20 milliohm controller, now the eight and the 10 turn motors have exactly the same efficiency, um, running exactly the same speed, but I'm doing the eight turn motor with a 36 volt pack and the 10 turn I had to run at 48 volts in order to match that climbing speed. Um, but yeah, the, that's the, the subject of, of KV winding choices. You really base it on how fast do you wanna go um, and then you choose the combination of your battery voltage and your motor winding to achieve that speed. Um, and if you are um, needing a high amount of torque and a high amount of, of phase current and you have a fast motor, it might mean that you need to spec a motor controller with a higher phase amperage or more MOSFETs. Um, but the motor itself, the two motors, fast and slow winds, are perfectly equivalent in their ability to output the same torque at the same power when hill climbing. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, this is 100% <laughs> uh, where so much of this comes from, this idea that uh, there's a trade-off between torque and speed. So when you change the gearing of a motor, you totally have a trade-off between torque and speed. Um, when you um, change the winding, the KV of a motor, you're not doing any trade-off between torque and speed, you're changing the trade-off between volts and amps. Um, so a Faster motor is really a lower voltage motor. It needs higher amperage. And a slower motor is really a higher voltage motor running at a lower amperage. 
And if anyone is familiar with electronics, it doesn't really matter if you run a high voltage and a low amps or a low voltage and a high amps for the given power, it's the same power. Um, and I always use the analogy that different motor windings, it's more like uh, 220 volt versus 120 volt light bulbs. If you're in Europe, you're running 220 volts and your light bulbs are rated for 220 volts, they have higher resistance, they draw less amperage at a higher voltage, but they sign at exactly the same brightness as a 110 volt light bulb in North America that has a lower resistance filament that draws more amperage, but that also outputs the same wattage. Um, so yeah, really, really economy succession. And it's, it's, not, it's not totally grounded in fallacy because um, you can do some firsthand experiences that seem to uh, confirm or affirm that bias that a, a faster motor is going to have less torque. Um, and you get that if you choose a motor controller that has a lot of uh, um, winding or a lot of resistance, so higher resistance MOSFETs and a lower gauge phase wire. Um, and it also has a, a phase current limit that comes into play. Um, and so here um, we have, we're running with a 20 amp motor controller and we also have a phase amp limit. Um, so let me get rid of auto throttle, simulate. Um, oh, right, go full throttle. Um, so here I have a, um, a motor amp limit of 40 amps in this simulation tool. Um, so with a 10 turn motor, and a phase limit of 40 amps, a maximum 44 newton meters of torque. And if I was to get a faster motor wind, uh, the eight turn motor, uh, now you see my torque has dropped down to 35 newton meters instead of 40 some odd newton meters. Um, and so here, the faster motor has less torque. It has less torque not because the motor is incapable of producing the same torque, but because we're running them with the same 40 amp motor current limit of the motor controller. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, um, so. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> there's, well, a lot of stuff scrolling back through here. I think for now, I mean, I've touched on a whole bunch of different topics. This has been kind of fun. I, I think that the medium of, uh, of uh, being able to answer questions in real time is enjoyable and sort of demonstrating how to use these tools. Um, so I think on this note, it's now 9.30. I've been talking for two and a half hours. Um, we'll call this uh, this um, webinar, this broadcast over. Um, that, but then I, what I'll probably do is put a little poll on our website uh, to decide what topics people are most interested in covering in future webinars. Um, and then we can have a, an ongoing way for you to give us feedback on what uh, areas you think would be most interesting to have covered this way. Um, and then I also do want to follow through a little bit more on uh, some of these topics that I had um, planned for my presentations here, um, given direct drive choices, really a detailed use on using our trip simulators. Um, and I really love to go into a deeper dive on dual motor systems. I think they're interesting, interesting topics. Um, that have a lot of nuance that isn't necessarily obvious up front. So, yeah, so really thank you everyone who tuned in to watch this and, uh, and then stay tuned for more um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and all of you in your virtual SPSI world. Um, <laughs> I look forward to it. It looks like they will do the actual SPSI uh, possibly in August um, and we'll see whether or not we'll still be able to make it out there. But uh, um, yeah, time to go for a ride, no doubt. Thanks everybody. <laughs>